of a few folks we need to remember tonight. Some nice new reporters. Uh, one is Francis Daigle of New Report. He passed away in March 19th. He uh, served in the Army for four years, native of Salisbury, a jack of all trades. He is special to us because he actually worked in the New Report DPW. And he was also custodian of City Hall for several years and then became the supervisor for the Belleville Cemetery. So let's keep Mr. Daigle's family in our thoughts tonight. Another new reporter is Jeffrey Alcorn. He passed away on March 15th from uh, Alzheimer's. A uh, Boston person, Melrose High grad, Brown, School, Brown University, class of 66, served in the Army in Vietnam, uh, became a new reporter, member of the Continental Navy, member of the Exchange Club, and special to us because he was a Ward 1P poll worker for many municipal cycles. Let's keep them, the Alcorn family, in our prayers this evening. And last but not least, this is an obit that I cannot sum up. For those who have not heard, Mayor Matthews passed away over the weekend. Wow. Um, words just don't describe what this gentleman did for our community. So, Mayor Matthews, former mayor of Newburyport, passed away peacefully on March 25th in Newburyport. He enjoyed a remarkable and productive 94-year life as a leader in Newburyport, the North Shore, and the Merrimack Valley. He was born at Anna Jake's Hospital on August 31st, 1928, son of John and Rosa Matthews, one of three brothers. He is survived by Nicholas Matthews and predeceased by Anthony Matthews of Newburyport. He was married to Helen for 69 years, and they had two sons, John and Peter, at their home in the Belleville neighborhood. He graduated from Newburyport High School in 1946, then joined the U.S. Marine Corps, Semper Fi. He later earned a degree in accounting from Bentley College. While running and expanding the family business Matthews Market on Maple Street, Byron is encouraged by customers and friends to become involved in local government. After serving three terms on the city council, he was elected mayor of Newburyport and served five consecutive terms. He embarked on an aggressive program to rejuvenate and preserve his beloved historic hometown. Projects included the restoration of downtown Newburyport, including the waterfront boardwalk, the Custom House, building the Industrial Park, the Knock Middle School, the new reservoir, expansion of municipal infrastructure in the Central and West End fire stations. He worked with state and federal officials to bring millions of dollars to fund these projects. After 10 years as mayor, he became the director of the newly formed North Shore Economic Council, and shortly after that was recruited by Governor Edward King to serve as the cabinet as Secretary of Communities and Development. This was followed by several years in the private sector where he developed new residential communities in Florida, New York, and New England. He was a parishioner in Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church where his father and uncle were founders, and he was served on the parish council for 10 years. After the church suffered a devastating fire, he served on the building committee and for a new church that opened in 1983. The building was designed by his long-term friend and business associate, the late Jonathan Woodman. Byron served as chairman of the New Report Cooperative Bank and was appointed by President George H.W. Bush to the board of Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston. He was the managing partner of the Racquet Club of New Report. Byron's civic involvement continued throughout his life. He was appointed to the Board of Trustees of Northern Essex Community College and served as chairman from 1997 through 2006, then later as a member of the College Foundation. He served as a member of the Building Committee of the Newburyport Public Library when it was renovated and expanded and a term on the Newburyport Redevelopment Authority. In 2011, in recognition of his contributions to the city of Newburyport, a granite monument was dedicated on Byron's Court adjacent to the N Street Pedestrian Mall. It was a grand celebration. Speakers included former Governor Michael Dukakis and former Congressman Michael Harrington. In more recent years, a great deal of his efforts were dedicated towards Anna Jake's Hospital, where he, was, he served as a member of the Seacoast Regional Health System, chairman of the Anna Jake's Community Health Foundation, the building committee, and directed the annual golf tournament for 30 years. In 2022, Byron and Helen were honored to have the main entrance of Anna Jake's Hospital dedicated in their names, recognizing years of devoted service to the continued success and expansion of the hospital.
Byron is a son of Newburyport, growing up through the Great Depression, the Second World War, and then the father of the city laying the foundation of the vibrant and successful place that it is today. He's survived by his wife, Helen, and his sons, John, and numerous others. Um, Mayor Matthews is a true Newburyporter. This was a life well lived. Newburyport would not be Newburyport today if it had not been for Mayor Matthews. Moment of silence, please. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Court Jones, if you would call the roll. For the meeting of March 27, 2023, Councilor Khan. Present. <laughs> I didn't know I was first. <laughs> Councilor Lane. Here. Councilor McCauley. Here. Councilor Preston. Here. Councilor Vogel. Present. Councilor Wallace. Here. Councilor Wright. Here. Councilor Z. Here. Councilor Cameron. Here. Councilor Dunyu. Here. And Councilor Shan. Present. <clears throat> Late files. There's one late file the councilors will see on their desk. It's appointment 388, Wayne Amaral of Amesbury to DPS director until 4 1 2026. Motion to waive the rules and accept the late file. Second. Second. Just leave. Councilor Walls? <coughs> on this item going forward, I'll be recusing myself from okay. any of the votes. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. All those in favor of waiving the rules and accepting late file, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Public comment. So for those on Zoom, please raise your hand. You'll have two minutes to speak on a topic on the agenda, your name and address, and you can use our names as much as you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I see one hand on Zoom. All right, with all that, with that being said, the only hand from Zoom we'll have tonight is Kristen Farrell. So Kristen, I've allowed you to speak, name and address, and two minutes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. My name is Kristen Farrell, 28 Spock. The Commission on Disabilities, and I just wanted to speak briefly about the two items that you have within your agenda for your consideration tonight, um, the approval of the bylaws for the new report Commission on Disabilities, which has gone before the Community Services Committee, and the um, handicap parking violation fact sheet and data analysis that we have compiled to request an increase in the handicapped parking violation fee, um, which has gone before the Committee for Public Works and Safety. Um, we've been working very hard on the Commission on Disabilities on our bylaws. Um, Sophie Corpix, who is a member of the Commission, um, has um, really spearheaded the creation of these bylaws, and we're really um, proud of the document that has been created, and we feel that it is a really great representation of the work that we strive to do and that we do, um, you know, month after month um, for the residents and uh, people that visit and live here within Newburyport. Um, as far as the handicap parking violation um, information, I think that you'll find it interesting and, and overall the um, intent of the elevated parking violation fee is to ultimately um, discourage people from breaking these laws. So um, we're happy to uh, present both of these items on your agenda and thanks again to all of you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Farrell. All right, with that being it for our Zoom folks uh, in council chambers, first we have on the list is Ben Iacono. 
Thank you, and good evening. My name is Ben Anacono for Hallisey Drive. I am here to speak regarding the proposed ordinance ODNC 00129. I would like to express my concern about the message that the city will send to many organizations who for many years have provided financial, physical, and advocacy support for various causes and needs of our citizenry by the passage of this ordinance as is currently proposed. The city of Newburyport has been blessed for many years. Get closer to the microphone. Sorry, they can't hear you at home. The city of Newburyport has been blessed for many years with a benevolent and generous population and has always been ready to support causes, needs, and services to city departments, agencies, and boards to augment their efforts to make the best life possible for our citizens. Over the years since the city's birth, organizations have been established, many still active to this day, to provide additional resources beyond available funds of the city. The close working relationships and collaborations that these organizations have developed with their respective city departments have been an integral part in defining the needs and the means to help and support. This ordinance now proposes to build an unnecessary barrier to this relationship and effective execution of support by restricting valuable coordination actions between the organizations and or individuals with the respective city departments and its leader. Specifically, the provisions outlined in paragraph B, C, and E, it turns a friend's relationship to an arm's length relationship. The reverse, the reverse support that these organizations receive from the respective departments is insignificant to what they provide in return. While it's been stated this ordinance defines the role of the department leader, the resulting impact to the collaboration relationship has, been, has not been fully explored. I urge you to vote against the passage of this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Icona. Next is James Jones. Counselors, my name is James Jones and I live at Two Wills Lane. I represent more than 280 Newburyport residents that play pickleball. I am here to offer comment on Mr. Cootie's letter regarding pickleball at Lower Atkinson. I have a more detailed response that I would be happy to make available to council. First, let me emphasize, Newburyport Pickleball is more than willing to compromise and work together to address the concerns that have with having a multi-sport court at Lower Atkinson. Mr. Cooley's, excuse me, Mr. Cootie's letter outlines three main concerns, safety, park overuse, and narrowing field availability. The underlying premise for these three concerns largely centers on pickleball being played during Pioneer League games and practices. To address these concerns, Newburyport Pickleball would take the following measures. We would not have organized play when the Pioneer League has its games and practices. Instead, we would seek the Parks Commission's approval for organized play three mornings per week. Using an online registration platform, we would be able to control the hours, days, and number of players participating in organized play. Organized sessions would be fully supervised at all times. While pickup play among friends may occur at times outside of organized play, we would encourage the Parks Commission to restrict pickleball and basketball during league games and practices. With organized sessions during the morning and not during Pioneer League play, there would be much less of a burden on parking. Even so, many pickleball players already ride, share, walk, and bicycle to other venues, and we would encourage them to do so at Lower Atkinson. In conclusion, let me say, while we may all may have differences, we are not adversaries. We all want our public parks to thrive and, off and offer activities for all members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Next on the list is Owen Smith. Yeah, good evening. Owen Smith, 175 Story Avenue. Um, so I'm here today to talk about Transfer 149 and in general just the way we uh, handle budget monitoring. Uh, I'm one person who really does believe little things add up to big things over time. Uh, monitoring line items for our, our budget for a while this fiscal year. And I have noticed some abnormal spending, you know, higher burn rates than expected. And on two occasions I was told the budget is set at the department group level 
Um, you know, and I'm curious, why do we do that? You know, uh, we set ourselves up to fraud, waste, abuse, gross mismanagement if we're not actually enforcing the budget by the line. Um, I can give an example, say we got a, an, a department with a mission that's very consumable driven and very labor driven. If we blow the consumable budget 200%, we don't have the money to spend on labor. That's like misappropriating public funds. So in the core of it, you need to be watching the whole budget. Um, and then on this transfer 149 example, I'd say, you know, why is it that we're seven, eight months into the fiscal year after the Portage on budget got blown out of the water? You know, why are we uh, reallocating funds for unemployment insurance that we had to pay claims on when that decision was made in July? These are foreseeable things. This is budget management 101. I would expect that the city council basically set a high standard for the administration to make sure that we're monitoring the budget line item by line item and that these questions are addressed at the time of the encumbrance, not eight months later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. And last is Paul Bevilacqua. Thank you. I'm Paul Bevilacqua. I live at 126 Merrimack Street, Unit 3. I'm basically here to support everything Ben Iacono just said. I agree with everything he said, as I've mentioned to several counselors. But I also wanted to ask you to consider, I'm not sure if this, um, pro these proposed arguments should be defeated, but at least they should be discussed in a very open forum, and we could have an opportunity to understand the implications, the intent, and the goals and, and how far-reaching they are. I don't think the proposers or the council understands the implications this could have for support from the community uh, for various activities. I understand the need for ordinances. I've written them. I understand the need for regulations. I've written them and I've enforced them. I also understand they can have a positive effect or they can have a negative effect. When I read these, they feel very punitive and, is a, and they're not clear. They can be interpreted in multiple ways. So I ask the council to, to please consider returning this to committee or doing something so that there can be further discussion and explanation of what the intent, what the goal is, and how these will be applied in the future to the benefit of everybody, both the agencies and the nonprofits that are, that are in, involved with the various, supporting the various agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bevilacqua. And that is it for public comment. So, Mayor's comment. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, just real quick on Byron Matthews, you know, I got the call early Sunday morning and, uh, you know, Council President really said it all uh, reading his obituary, but um, just, just a true le legend. Uh, you know, growing up here, he was always just a larger than life figure to me. And his wife was, is a legend in her own right, Helen, of, you know, who he's married to 69 years. Helen was the longtime secretary at the Belleville and now Bresnahan School. But uh, just a real power couple, I would say, in New Report, but just really down to earth, great people. Um, you know, when I got elected, uh, Byron pulled me aside on election, uh, on my inauguration day, and it was just amazing that he made it there that day, because I didn't, I didn't know if he was going to be there or not, but he gave me a coin, and I carry it around with me every day, um, but it's a 125th anniversary, uh, coin from, uh, 1976 when downtown was getting done over, so it's just kind of a little memento, and it was really great, uh, that he was able to do that for me. And just another note, uh, Clark Jones and I were able to take uh, the former mayor out to lunch a few weeks ago, and it was really, according to the family, one of the last like, kind of outings for him, and he was just awesome during that lunch. Uh, and so we, you know, Clark Jones and I both feel very fortunate that we were able to do that. Uh, so again, uh, a heartfelt uh, condolences to the family, and really, born in Anna Jakes, Clipper, city councilman, mayor, and just walk through downtown, what a legacy. Uh, I don't think any mayor has a legacy like that, that you can walk through downtown and see what, what the beautiful town that he created. So hats off to the uh, Matthews family, and uh, there are our thoughts and prayers. Uh, the worst kept secret in town is out. Uh, we hired a DPS director, so that is in your packet tonight. So uh, thank you for approving that late file. Uh, again, of course, even West Newby would like us to move on this as quickly as possible <laughs> so they can begin their search. But uh, just really happy that Wayne decided to put his name in for this position. Uh, you know, he didn't the first time around, and that was, uh, you know, respect to Jamie. He had so much respect for Jamie that he didn't. But when Jamie moved on, he really, you know, this is to him, this is his dream job. And uh, he's been, had an eye on the report for a long time since he left. 
uh, five years ago, so it's just really wonderful that we're able to bring someone back with that kind of skill set, with the famili familiarity of the city and the DPS uh, barn down there on Perry Way, and uh, we're really excited for him to come in and kind of uh, hit the ground running. Uh, some of the other things going on right now, the fire chief search, uh, we were able to get uh, eight applicants for that as well, and I believe the search committee has a meeting on Friday uh, that they'll start going through those, and the idea there is to uh, whittle it down to four or five really great candidates that we'll put through the fire chief's assessment. Uh, but we'll uh, keep track of that, and uh, I know Councilor McCauley and Council Preston will, will keep us informed on that as well. Uh, the Palio and Dredge. Did it start tonight? Did it start tonight? So we were told that it could start tonight, so I'll keep listening to hear if I can, we can hear it crank up out on Plum Island, but if it doesn't start tonight, it's supposed to start first thing tomorrow, so we're really excited for that. Just a reminder to residents, we really, we fortified our position down there today as far as putting up some more fencing, and um, we really need people to stay off the beach now. It's, it's go time, so it's gonna be pretty dangerous down there. Um, I think residents are just used to, especially since we've had this big, uh, big long time of inactivity to be able to go out there and still walk your dog and check out the beach, but it's now officially closed. So uh, please uh, heed that warning and let us get this job started and hopefully completed and then we can go from there. Uh, our schools, uh, we don't meet again until next Monday, but uh, so we haven't, had, we haven't seen the budget, the latest budget that uh, Superintendent Gallagher will present. Uh, the last meeting we had, as you know, were the individual uh, presentations by the schools and so now Superintendent Gallagher is, is formulating that into his budget. So uh, the next meeting will begin with a public hearing. So if you want to come and speak on behalf uh, in front of the school committee, you're welcome to do that then. And then we'll finally get to see uh, where we are, we are where we are at with the budget. And again, this will be the first. And then they will vote on that budget at the end of April. Um, and again, because of April vacation, it really is the end of April. It's, right, it's on a Tuesday right after your last meeting of the month, that last month of April as well. Uh, the health department last week installed new uh, signs at our uh, public access points on the river for uh, CSOs. What's neat about these signs is that it has a QR code on them, so someone with a smartphone can always go up and check um, the health of the river and if there had been any recent uh, CSO discharges. Uh, and this is just an addition to the, all the other ways we push out information, particularly on the website, regarding uh, CSOs. So uh, we were excited for the health department to be able to do that. That's going to help our process. On the city side, I'll just let you know budget-wise, we're still having our conversations with department heads. We have a lot of meetings set up this week, uh, but we should have them done by Friday, uh, and then you know, we'll, work, we'll work with our team and then Ethan's office to uh, start putting together those pieces. But it's been really great listening to where all the departments are coming from this year, opposed to last year. Again, this is my second time going through the budget now. Um, I've really made it a point, not only with the schools, but our, our departments here to really look for ways where we can reallocate funds that we already have in our budget to fund some of these priorities that they might have for the year. And I really want them to highlight that when we get to the budget hearing process this year. Because um, I think it's important that we're not always asking for, for new funds in the budget, but they're actually looking to see uh, you know, what's working, what's not, and can we use that money uh, to help push, push some other initiatives forward. So I've been happy with what I've been hearing so far. Uh, a couple other things I wanted to mention, uh, the comprehensive economic development strategy, we should be getting that f uh, final report soon, so that should be great once we have that in hand, and, that, and, then, and then if there are any uh, budget Im implications with that strategy, that we'll be able to incorporate those. Uh, that's that SEDS plan that, that um, I know Andrew Levine has been working hard on, but uh, working with Carl Seidman out of MIT and his team in Civic Moxie, so uh, we're excited for that, and that's again, that's all around our economic development strategy. Uh, the MEVA bus routes, I know everyone's really excited about that. That's uh, going to be launched on uh, Monday, April 3rd. In the middle of the month, we were able to ch uh, check out those new bus routes, and it's just really, I do think it's improved greatly. Um, I think it's going to improve uh, transportation between Amesbury, Salisbury, and Newburyport. Uh, what's great about uh, MEVA is they're still willing uh, to hear comments on the routes, and I do think there's still a couple other uh, neighborhoods in Newburyport that I'd like to try to see uh, included in that, so we're going to continue to work with them. But those new routes will officially launch on Monday, April 3rd. And let's see, the Forever Green campaign is still going on, so thank you to everyone who came out for uh, Restaurant Week, but now uh, the Forever Green campaign is still going on, and that's through the Chamber of Commerce in the city. Um, we're going to have a Windows of cha uh, Change event, where there will be a lot of uh, windows around the city dressed up by, by local artists, uh, giving uh, awareness, environmental education towards ecotourism. So that's really exciting. And that's going to lead us all the way up to Earth Day. So if you're looking for events around that, then just again, check out the city and chamber websites. And the community iftar is on uh, tomorrow night, which I'm excited about. Uh, 
two, million, uh, two billion Muslims world, worldwide. It's uh, Abadan's holiest period in the Islamic calendar. So I want to thank the Human Rights Commission for putting this on every year. We're at the high school this year. Okay, we're going to be in the cafeteria uh, from 6 to 9. So please come join us. And that's it. Anyone have any questions? Councilor Khan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you for the Ramadan greetings. Appreciate it. Um, I had a question on the Plum Island dredging. Uh, I believe I heard from some residents if there's been a change in any of the plans on the original in terms of the replenishing of the sand, where could they have access to any of the plan modification or how that's moving forth? Will that be on the website, the city's website? So everything is on the website right now and, and under the planning department. You can find the dredge uh, planning. I will say on the, I don't think plans have changed. I think they're going to do more surveys on the area to see. Right now they're anticipating that it's going to just not be as, as much sand as they thought it was going to be originally. They were saying at, some, at the beginning of the stages, they were saying close to almost 300,000 uh, cubic yards of sand. Now it was down to 230, and now they're thinking it's going to be around closer to 200. Uh, but that's not a finalized thing yet. So that, that, that means the, the plan really hasn't changed, but they're going to be working from, I say, 69 over as far as how they place the sand. Um, again, it's, it's not as much sand, so we're not going to know until they start getting the sand out there uh, oh, what that okay. looks like and how much it is. Great. All right. And okay. just on that, too, so, I mean, we do have a, a big section of the beach, right, from 75th to 77th that has changed drastically over the past two years as well. Uh, so we are having in, uh, internal conversations, still working with Senator Tar's office. We're working with DCR. So those meetings are coming up. Uh, I asked Councillor Z to be a part of those meetings as well uh, as the Ward 1 Councillor. So we're... You know, we're excited we're getting that group together because that is an issue. I think once the dredge gets completed, you know, we're going to be, you know, that's going to be a real problem issue that we're still going to have to find some solutions for. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Lang. Um, I know you brought up CSOs, and I'm not a big fan of the flagging at all. Mm -hmm. um, has anything been done? Any communications been, have you heard of anything being done about the CSO problem? Well, most of these problems need to be really handled by funding from the federal level. What we're trying to do, which I've been trying to lead with Senator Tarr, is uh, start up more communications regionally. So this is coming all the way from Concord, New Hampshire, all the way down to, to Newburyport. So those have been started. We're working with the Mer Merrimack Valley Planning Commission on getting those conversations going. So we're really just in a stakeholder gathering stage because I think once COVID hit, a lot of those conversations really died down. I know former Senator and now State Auditor Zoglio was leading a, the charge on a lot of those, so Senator Tar and I are trying to pick up that baton. But uh, we, we are getting, I think we are getting somewhere, it's just it's a little, it's a little bit of a slow process right now. But the, I think the idea is if we can collectively um, advocate for funding at the federal level, uh, you know, we had Moulton and Trey in uh, here not that long ago and we talked a lot about that, uh, the CSO problem. So it is on their radar and I think if we can partner with the our partners up in New Hampshire that we should get some traction. I just think, you know, I think we're getting kicked in the gut over this thing because now that we have, you know, a, a flagging system that people aren't going to want to come here, who's going to want to go to the beach when it's a, it's a red day? Sure. Yeah, no, I understand so that. That impacts us financially. So, I mean, I would just urge you and whoever to keep on with that in place or just to disable it. You know, I mean, it's... It, well, I think it's state law now. We have to we have to notify it when we, we get notified. But yeah, it's just awful that it falls on us. Yeah, so. yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. Um, I have one quick one. You mentioned the public hearing on the school committee budget. Yes. When is that date? So that's next Monday. Next Monday. Yep. Okay. Six thirty. All right. Further questions. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Court Jones. The consent agenda this evening uh, consists of the approval of the minute from March 13th. There are five communications. Um, the first three are applications for events, Flag Day 5K, uh, Greater New Report Ovarian Race 5K, and an event local, uh, Love Local on Inn Street, Thursday, May 18th. Those are all going to license and permits. Communication 472 is a letter from uh, Kathleen O'Connor Ives going to general government. Communication 473 is an update on the 2023 parklets going to uh, public works and safety. Transfer 150 uh, is a uh, general cash, 30,000 to City Hall, main floor HVAC, same amount to go to budget and finance. Uh, one appointment, 387, Thomas O'Brien, 11 Mosley Avenue to the Water Sewer Commission. 331, 2025 uh, to public works and safety. Following items are removed from their respective uh, budgets, uh, uh, committees, excuse me, budget and finance. 
Transfer 149, Ordinance 144. Ordinance 129 is um, been removed at the request of Council Z. That's not coming out. Ordinance 130, 132. Community Services, Appointment 386. Order 431, Ordinances 145, 147. Communication 471 and Order 422. License and Permits, Applications 123, 125. Public Works and Safety, Appointment 382. Ordinance 140, Communication 466, Orders 432, 433. And with that one change, that's a consent agenda this evening. Motion to approve. Before you approve that, could you remove um, uh, Application 125 from the consent agenda so I can properly recuse myself? Can I also ask, it was 129 that is not coming out of Correct. BNF? Okay, thank you. Ordinance 129. Yeah, yeah, and thank you. And that application was what number? 125. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. All right. Moving right along. We have um, the late file appointment 388, Wayne Amaral, uh, Amesbury. Motion to refer to Public Works and Safety. Second. 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 Discussion? All those in favor moving to Public Works and Safety, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Second reading appointment uh, 385, Eileen Hartz Grady, 10 Cushing Ave to the Human Rights Commission 430, 2026. Motion to approve on second reading. Second. Discussion? Roll call. So on appointment um, 385. Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor Lane? Yes. Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wallace? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Seed? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Donahue? Yes. Councilor Shan? Yes. Thank you. Point of order. Uh, Mayor's update. <laughs> Motion receiving file. Second. All those in favor of receiving filing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Councilor McCauley. Thank you. First order is uh, 434, um, fiscal year 2024 CPC recommendations. Can we take that and 435, 6, and 7 together? Certainly can. Motion to refer 434 to Budget and Finance and Committee of the Whole, and then 435, 6, and 7 to, to Budget and Finance as well. Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Sorry, but point of order. Can we still read those into the record? Certainly can. So ordinance uh, 434, as I mentioned, is the CPC recommendations. 435 is the Buildings Up grant acceptance. 436 is Catherine Day gift acceptance. And three, uh, 437 is the Marl Foundation gift acceptance. Thank you, Councilor Kahn. That leads us to order uh, 438, which the, is the really an update to our election calendar, outlining the uh, early voting in person at the Senior Center for the preliminary, which would be the uh, three days before the September 19th um, election, if needed, and the um, six days before the final election in November. Motion to refer to general government. Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Second reading, Ordinance 139, which is the amended municipal fee schedule food truck. Motion to approve in second reading. Second. Discussion? Roll call? This is on Ordinance 139, Councilor Khan. Yes. Councilor Lane. Yes. Councilor McCauley. Yes. Councilor Preston. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Wallace. Yes. Councilor Wright. Yes. Councilor Zeed. No. No. 
Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunnew? Yes. Councilor Chan? Yes. <coughs> One, motion passes second reading. Which leads us to Ordinance 136, second reading of the General Code Planning Board membership. Motion change. to approve on second reading. Second. second. Can we add 137 collectively? Certainly. Which is the zoning amendment for the planning board membership. Since they go together. Discussion. Second. 136 and 137, second reading. Second. Thank you. Discussion. Roll call. Councillor Kahn? Yes. Councillor Lane? Yes. Councillor McCauley? Yes. Councillor Preston? Yes. Councillor Vogel? Yes. Councillor Wallace? Yes. Councillor Wright? Yes. Councillor Zeed? Yes. Councillor Cameron? Yes. Councillor Dunnew? Yes. And Councillor Shan? Yes. Thank you. Both approved on second reading. Which leads us to Ordinance 138, second reading of the amended municipal fee schedule in permit. Motion to approve on second reading. Second. second. Roll call. Councillor Kahn? Yes. Councillor Lane? Yes. Councillor McCauley? Yes. Councillor Preston? Yes. Councillor Vogel? Yes. Councillor Wallace? Yes. Councillor Wright? Yes. Councillor Zeed? No. Councillor Cameron? Yes. Councillor Dunnew? Yes. Councillor Shan? Yes. 10 1. Motion passes. Second reading. Committee items. Budget and finance. Uh, motion to approve transfer 149. Second. Second. Thank you. So, uh, committee met uh, Thursday before last. This is a transfer. Uh, the amount of the transfer is 32500 coming from the parks salary director line and then being split into three destinations, uh, HR and employment claims in the amount of 20 k HR job advertising 3 k uh, park equipment 7 k sorry, four uh, accounts, and then finally park restroom rentals 2500 um, As I mentioned, the committee did meet. Um, first thing is, as usual, let's talk about the source of funds. Um, there's about $68,700 in the park salary director line item to start. Uh, this is a request for, let's call it roughly half of that, uh, 32 five. Um, and then in terms of the destinations, we did go through each one of those with the finance director. So the first one was an unemployment claim, uh, line transfer 20K. Um, this is the result of a, an, an unemployment claim that the city did contest but was not successful in contesting and as a result um, does need to pay on the claim and that's the request uh, as stated. Uh, the balance in this line is currently in a deficit uh, but the overall category is not but with this transfer it will be brought back into the positive um, line item. The next one was HR job advertising. Uh, this is 3K, relatively small amount but the primary reason was just competitive uh, job uh, market combined with more positions needing to be filled has led to more advertising needing to be done and that's the reason for that. Also in a, in a minor deficit there as well. Parks maintenance equipment, um, 7K. Um, basically it's uh, essentially being used towards small handheld type replacements. Uh, think of things like weed eaters and leaf blowers and things like that, chainsaws, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's where the 7K is going to. And then finally, we, had the, it, we did have a discussion about the, uh, the restrooms, the porta, porta potties, so to say. And um, basically, uh, porta potties came, came to be during COVID very quickly as facilities were in flux between open and close. So uh, basically, porta potties were brought in in order to meet those needs and was being paid to external companies in order to bring them, maintain them, empty them, clean them, all those sorts of things. At the beginning, um, a lot of those were being paid for out of COVID funds. You know, take your pick of which one from the potpourri of, of COVID funds we had at the time, FEMA, MEMA, um, et cetera. That money has since dried up. Um, the porta potties were sort of not immediately removed, so they remained and the bills kept coming. Um, as a result, they do need to be paid for. That's the $2,500 here. That'll bring this to zero. And I think uh, what the finance director told us was essentially, you know, um, sort of they're going to recall a lot of those restrooms, you know, send them back to where they came from, and then sort of reassess what the need actually is and if they were being used, because when you contract with those companies, Obviously, they'll just keep coming. It's sort of like a delivery, and then they just don't stop. And so um, that is the end of the conversation on those four uh, destinations. We did deliberate a little bit. Uh, we did have some public comment, some of which you heard this evening in, in public comment here. Uh, in the end, the committee saw fit two to zero um, to recommend to you approval of this transfer. Thank you, Councillor Zaid. Further discussion? 
Councillor Vogel. Thank you, Council President. If I may, I just have a question, if I may direct. Um, the, um, you know, my understanding of um, unemployment is, you know, as, as payroll goes along, you put into, um, you make your contribution based on uh, the, whatever <coughs> category you're in, and you make contributions to your unemployment fund. And I'm surprised that um, we, first of all, ran into a deficit. I, I'm not sure how we got into a deficit. I would be curious about that. And then secondly, um, how it is that we hadn't been keeping up. So those are, I guess that's sort of the same question, but the fact that we're just hearing about a deficit on this transfer, and then how it was that we didn't keep up. I was wondering if that was discussed, and I'm, my apologies for not making the meeting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are better minds to answer that. I can answer, but I think I see both the HR director and the finance director, so as we'll get it direct from the source than through a third party. Ethan, I've allowed you to speak. Good evening, uh, councillors. So yes, the reason that this one came into a deficit all of a sudden, essentially, uh, is that the city had been contesting a large claim uh, that recently uh, it went through uh, on behalf of the employee. Uh, so that's why uh, we are needing to pay, um, you know, it seems like a larger amount right now. And then from here through the end of the year, it will just be the regular uh, monthly payments uh, for the unemployment claim. Go ahead, Councilor Vogel. Yeah, th th thank you, uh, 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 the Director. Um, so that only sort of answers the question. I mean, as I, I, I'm very familiar with paying unemployment um, or paying to my, my unemployment fund through the years, and it just sort of stacks up, and then you get a notice of somebody making a claim, and they take some out of it, and so on and so forth. What I don't understand is, is, is one large claim, I don't, I'm not sure how exactly one large claim um, drains the, the, the fund. I, maybe, maybe there's more to it municipally, I'm not sure, but I know my business-wise, um, it doesn't fall into a deficit. Could you maybe go just a little bit deeper? I know it's, it's, it's um, HR related and so forth, but still, if you could just go a little deeper, then I'm curious. Sure, so, so this line we keep at a 20000 dollars budget, uh, which I think given the size of the city's payroll is fairly modest. Um, we've been fairly lucky over the past several years uh, to kind of stay within that budget. Uh, but that said, there will be times uh, when we have to, you know, come back to the city council to ask for, you know, supplemental funding uh, if, you know, a big claim like this happens to come through. In, in, other, in, in other words, we're self-insured. To a degree, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you, Councillor Vogel. Further questions? All right. So the motion on the floor is to approve. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, next is a motion to approve Ordinance 144, which is an uh, amendment to the Departmental Revolving Funds. First reading. Second. Um, so this is uh, essentially a tail off of the parks reorganization. Um, you're probably familiar with the parks, um, it, pardon me, with the revolving funds. Some years ago, we did change a little bit how we do it. We used to authorize them annually by order, and we changed over to codifying the funds by ordinance, and then uh, we have to process less things, except mm -hmm. when they change, and this is one of those instances. So it's a fairly narrow change. Um, it is really the parks uh, maintenance fund, and we're basically changing the authorized party from the parks director uh, to the public services director. That is the only change. The, the, the use of the fund, the source of the funds are not, none of those things are changing. It's just who can, who's basically authorized to sign on the dotted line. And this one was one of, um, one of the things called out as one of the things that would need to be changed uh, to, to uh, efficate the, the change uh, of the park. So it was two to zero in committee. Thank you, Councilor Zaid. Further discussion or comments? All right, being an ordinance. Roll call. Roll call on uh, approving ordinance 144, first reading. Councilor Khan. Yes. Councilor Lane. Yes. Councilor McCauley. Yes. Councilor Preston. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Wallace. Yes. Councilor Wright. Yes. Councilor Z. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Donahue. Yes. Councilor Shan. Yes. Thank you. First reading. Uh, next is a motion to receive and file ordinance 130. Second. 
Thank you. Um, so this is a, one of the trio, uh, so to say. Um, 129 uh, is not coming out tonight. I'll talk about that once I conclude all the business. Um, 130 is the one that was relative to grants, gifts, and fees and the acceptance thereof. Um, I, I had proposed this, but just to give the committee a uh, report, um, this was designed to add you know, some more, let's call it emphasis on this. It's actually already state law. Uh, that gifts and grants need to be accepted in this way, and I know we've talked about this quite a bit, so I don't need to belabor it. But in the end, in consultation with both uh, the committee as well as uh, the finance director, it sort of felt like this ordinance didn't add too much since it was already state law, and that it had uh, served its intended effect of kind of drawing attention to the conversation, which it did, and so that's why it is being received and filed, and it is two to zero uh, in committee was the recommendation to do so. Thank you, Councilor Zaid. Discussion, Councilor Wallace. Uh, thank you, President Shand. I just want to make note, I know this is being received and filed, but um, I often hear this in the discussions too, that gifts over 500 have to be approved by the City Council. It's in fact gifts of any amount per the state law, and I have some documentation from KP Law um, back when Councilor Eigerman was still president. So that's just some, something to keep in mind. And, and here it says 500. Again, I understand this is receiving and filing, but just something to... To remember, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wallace. All right. Do we need a roll call for receiving and filing? Okay. All those in favor of receiving and filing Ordinance 130, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Keep Next is on. a motion to approve Ordinance 132 on first reading, uh, mandated reporting. Second. Thank you. So um, this is uh, number, let's call it number two of three. Um, basically what this ordinance states and asks for is uh, a report or a requirement to report from the uh, city auditor to the city council when there have been cases or instances of either confirmed or alleged with credible evidence uh, issues of malfeasance or misuse of public funds and so forth. Um, we did talk about this a bit in committee, um, and in particular, the conversation centered around whose, whose responsibility should, be to, should it be to report, keeping in mind that there actually already is some language um, in our ordinance about this, the auditor having some responsibilities about reporting irregularities, but nothing specifically about this, these types of things. And the amendment that's come, that it, as it came out, amended tonight, as you'll see, is we added some language in there about in consultation with the city solicitor. And that was really in large part to uh, alleviate concerns from the finance director that sometimes there is obviously interweaving between personnel issues and what this is requesting that is being reported on, and he would feel more comfortable if it was at least done in consultation with the city solicitor who could guide um, on those sorts of things. Um, so we did talk about it. This, um, this one did come out of committee with a recommendation to approve two to zero. And I'm just gonna break there and just speak more now as a sponsor for a brief minute while I have the floor. Um, about the intent. So my intent with this uh, as one of the sponsors, and I'm joined by the Ward 6 Councilor, is really to uh, relieve pressure and to create a bright line. So in other words, um, you know, if the, if the city auditor sees something, it shouldn't be an internal tussle in my opinion as to whether that gets reported to the council or not. And this just creates a very simple, I think easy to follow rule, essentially tell us what happened, tell us why it happened, and tell us how it cannot happen again. Um, it's really that simple. And I think that um, some of the practical considerations I've, I've personally felt is you could be having issues that are occurring and maybe even processing an appointment and you don't know what you don't know. And it, if it's not in front of you, how would you know to ask about it? And so I think this creates um, really just what I think is a fairly reasonable uh, request and also seeks to try and clear up that what I think sometimes is um, conflation between personnel issues and, and financial issues when it's the public money. Um, you, I, in my opinion, you're firmly in the, in the land of the city council and we do have a right to know that, um, but I have certainly offered a, val a relief valve for executive session if it's not something that makes sense uh, to be done on the floor. So I am asking for everybody's support on this. I think we've been through a long process on some challenges or concerns that we've had and I really wanna close the book on them and, and this one and, and 129 eventually, I hope, uh, are part of those solutions and uh, provide some clear framework for everybody and we can all uh, operate under sort of known circumstances and rules and not have a lot of gray where there's, that's where problems come from. So that's my ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Zaid. So Councilor Cameron, and then Councilor Khan. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to commend uh, uh, Councilor Zaid if, if he was the um, sole author of this uh, and, and I know he's the sponsor. Um, yeah, this makes a lot of sense and has a nice bright line. It builds on the, uh, 
The section in the ordinance is from 1971, but makes clear what the irregularities uh, would be. Um, and I like the uh, inclusion of the um, uh, possibility of materials in executive session, because sometimes these are murky things, and you can't quite figure out exactly what happened. And I think, you know, it just, just to be sensitive to those sort of issues, to have uh, the allowance of executive session makes a lot of sense. So I, I'm definitely in favor of this. Thank you, Councilor Cameron. Councilor Kahn. Great. Thank you, Council President. <clears throat> I was not at the meeting. Uh, I was on travel, but uh, so I didn't get to chime in how I felt. Uh, so I, you know, I definitely understand there's this intent. You know, we, we kind of saw some some things come before us, and this is obviously the way our ordinances are written, is to try to go about solving a, a problem when we see a problem. I also think it's our kind of our duty to ensure that in terms of our job and what we codify and work on uh, in our code of ordinances for the city should be cognizant of what could be something actionable and realistic to execute. Uh, a few things that I would like to speak on in regard to this, so when I look at section two, especially under the city auditor's role, uh, the section previously, and it was mentioned by the chair, section 2-176, which does go into some detail of reporting. Uh, the reporting <coughs> noted in that section from 1971, as we just heard, is about errors found. What I'm kind of hoping that we could do is, if there was a way, and this would have been my suggestion, is to look at that language and see how that language could have been modified to effectively maybe address some of the findings that we're kind of the situations we're seeing ourselves in now. The, the, the kind of problem areas that I see here uh, is, you know, we, whether there's credible evidence of either alleged or confirmed. And I guess my worry is really the, the alleged, and, and there's no, investigation, no, the way this is written is that we are kind of going on some aspect of there being a, a problem. And in terms of the judge, the jury, the discussion, the, the assessment committee that's gonna kind of look at this situation and determine whether first the evidence is credible, second whether it's alleged or is it actually confirmed, this creates to me a lot of things in our codification process that is to me a, a little bit uh, I would say in terms of <laughs> execution or where we're providing value seems amiss to me. And instead, I think it creates more of a, a, an area of contention or an area of misunderstanding or actually, I hate to say it, misuse. Uh, we know emotions run high <laughs> and we all feel it, but you never know intentions. And I feel like this is written in a way for us to to look at intentions and instead our job will be having executive sessions kind of getting into a role which I really do think is under HR, it's under the administration and so I have a, a lot of problems with the way this is written and I will not be supporting the way it is right here and I would, um, since I wasn't there, I didn't even get to hear from the finance director on, on their take on this and if you don't mind um, Chair, I would, or uh, President, Council Presidents, I, I would like to hear from the um, our Ethan Manning, our finance director. Ethan, you just need to unmute yourself. So, okay, yes. Um, in terms of, of the proposed ordinance, um, a, a couple of the concerns that I expressed in committee, um, you know, basically involves putting my position kind of between a rock rock and a hard place if there is something, you know, that comes up um, that could potentially be, uh, let's say, a personnel matter um, and having to make a determination as to whether or not uh, this gets this hypothetical um, alleged or confirmed uh, fraud, what have you, uh, needs to get reported to the city council. Uh, I'm just kind of being placed in a situation where I'd either be, you know, violating, the, uh, you know, potentially someone's confidentiality uh, and or, um, you know, violating the provision of the proposed ordinance. Um, so that was pretty much my, my main hesitation. Um, but yeah, the word alleged, I mean, it does require some interpretation on, on the part of the city auditor um, 
which is really why I felt strongly about you know having this go through uh, city solicitor as kind of a conduit as in terms of you know getting this in information uh, to the city council, whether it's you know through an open meeting or executive session. May I? Sure, Councilor Kahn. Quick follow up. Well, has this language uh, been reviewed by the city sol solicitor, or that's normally done after we pass it here? Correct, or is it looked at by them? I don't know who to ask. Goes both I ways. I don't believe that they have looked at this as of yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Zeed, and then Councilor oh, Councilor Vogel. Thank you, uh, Council President. So I I, I stand um, in in uh, opposition. Um, in particular, uh, I find the comments of the um, at-large counselor to be spot on, and with all the same concerns, um, I'm really uncomfortable with the words un alleged as well. Um, also, it feels to me as though this is really not our ballywick. We, we should not be here. Um, the example given by the sponsoring counselor that you know perhaps we're considering a renewal of an appointment, but there may be some malfeasance going on behind the scenes that we're not aware of. I mean, I would trust at that point in time, if something like that were happening, that the administration would be letting us know that this appointment before us you know, should be in question or maybe it gets pulled. I mean, this is really, this, this is HR. This is, this is personnel issues. And the other question I have is, so what, what do we do next after we learn about it? What do we do with the information? You know, do we, then what? What are we, judge, jury, are we sentencer, what are we exactly? And I, so this, this is not us. Do we need to know when these things go on? Perhaps, perhaps in an appropriate executive session, but does it need to be in the books? I don't think so. I stand opposed, and I would hope everyone would stand opposed, or at the very least that we can put it back into committee and hear it a little bit more formally and a little bit more deeply. Thank you. Councilor Lang. I'm a little bit confused why we're defending fraud here. Um, so credible evidence is the key to me. So we're not just going on alleged things, but we're looking at protecting the city from fraud. So for me, alleged or confirmed, the two words credible evidence in the beginning is what does it for me. So I just don't see how we can go against this and I'm in full support. Councillor Zeed. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate the debate. And um, we, we did have, um, a, first of all, a couple rounds of discussion in committee about who should be the one. Um, and actually, uh, we did come back continuously to the city auditor as sort of the central um, position to have this responsibility because of their oversight over the numbers. So in other words, they're the, that person, whomever is in that position, is the one that sees it. I just want to address three points. Number one is, um, Alleged is actually an, an important word. Um, if you remove alleged and you only have proven, um, you could clip off a lot of potential uh, situations uh, where the city council really does need to know. Um, we are not here to assess or do anything. There isn't anything to do next. The point of this is notification, it's notice. The reason why, so you have three, three main things I'm hearing. Number one is, alleged and what does that mean and should you know if it's only alleged? Yes, if there's credible evidence that something has happened with, again, with public money, there isn't really an argument by charter or by ordinance or by common sense that the city council shouldn't know or shouldn't be involved in that in some way. So that's the first point. Second one is, is that sort of, is this our bailiwick? It is not our bailiwick to mete out discipline or to somehow have a talking to with a department head or anything of, of those sorts, but it is our, in our bailiwick to know. Uh, one counselor who recently spoke here is famous for saying the council only does three things, and one of those things is the budget. So it's hard to understand, especially too when you're hearing from public comment, why don't we budget things at the line level? And we're saying here, it's okay, we don't need to know if there's any fraud. We either never need to know or we'll find out later through some adjunct process. That's, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And then the last one is just what do we do next? The purpose of this is information. It's not to say what, what comes next is entirely unknown. It depends on the situation, it depends on the timing,
training. Um, it depends on all those things. But I'll just tell you for me, as chair of budget, the biggest thing for me in this, if you look at it, is what steps have been taken to inhibit this from happening again? Is it, an, is it a lack of an accounting control? Is it, a, is it something ordinance related that maybe is creating an inherent problem with how funds are being, and we just did an, an uh, approval of a, of a revolving fund. Things like that, the councils, of course, has, uh, has to do with that. So what is the answer? I don't know. Depends on the situation, depends on the timing, but, um, the council is a part of that at, at, to the extent that it's not something having to do with personnel. And so what I'm asking for is why would you say no to knowing this? What would be the harm in knowing the information? And actually, with due respect to the finance director, this takes pressure off of that position because you have to do it. You know, it's, it's not up to a mayor to decide, well, I don't want to tell the city council that it's not a good thing or it's not good news. There has to be a bright line test. And, I think this is pretty tight, actually, uh, relative to, to what it could be and, and gives a fairly narrow uh, path to that notification. Thank you. Councilor Seed, further discussion or comments? Councilor Donahue. Thank you, President. Um, I just want to <clears throat> add my two cents on this. I, I am very torn on how this makes me feel. Um, I can understand and appreciate the work on into it with the intention of trying to avoid fraudulent activity or at least finding out when it occurs. Um, but then there's part of me that feels that is this historically warranted and is this not the role of the administration and HR? And I, I do feel that we're, that maybe it's a little bit of an overreach. And um, I do appreciate the idea that if, if we had to go through this sort of um, process that, that it would be absolutely with KP Law, um, you know, commenting on it and having an executive session deciding if it's something that we should be involved in. But otherwise, I think it's, it's, it's a very slippery slope um, and it doesn't feel like it's, I mean, I, it's, it, it's a bit of a dichotomy because yes, we control the budget, we hold the purse, but I still feel like it's a little bit out of our lane and I just feel like we um, should be looking to the administration for handling these types of issues. If we have a person working for the city with alleged or proven fraudulent activity, they should not be reappointed to that position. And I would trust that the administration would not re reappoint them to that position. Um, so I just, that's where I'm a little torn. I, I don't think I'm gonna be supporting this as is, I, and maybe it would be better going back to committee for um, a further view. But as it stands, I, I don't think I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Council Wallace. Sure, uh, thank you, President. Just a couple things. Um, I strongly believe the city council is, is, has a fiduciary responsibility to the city, and that's even stated, if you look at any of the IG reports that are done on different municipalities, they'll come out and state the city council, these are their responsibilities, this is what they should have done. Um, and it, oftentimes, too, the IG might come out with, these are the recommendations that you need for your internal controls. So it's kind of similar to this in that um, it's spelling out the process although we're doing it ourselves in-house. Um, and it, it's just tough because that we were at you know, a committee meeting a couple weeks ago where we were told we can't ask questions. We're not allowed to ask too many questions. And so now there's a process, writing down a process, but we can't follow this process either. But we do have fiduciary responsibilities. And if you ask the residents and the voters that we represent, I think they're gonna want us to ask questions and look into financial matters when necessary. Thank you. Further discussion and comments? Councilor McCauley. Yeah, uh, I, will, uh, I will be supporting this. Um, I do think that this uh, clearly articulates those things that we need to be looking for and looking into. Um, I, I disagree that this, is, um, this bleeds into an HR type of discussion because uh, nothing here suggests that we're actually taking a personnel <laughs> what, we're take, what we're looking at and we want to be notified of is actions. So there's no, there's no implicit um, uh, uh, confidentiality between an auditor and an employee. Uh, it's really a transaction and that's all we're looking for. We're looking for uh, instances 
not associated with the person, but instances of the transaction that could be a misuse of public funds. And that qu clearly falls under our purview. And it clearly is something that uh, I, for one, am a fan of that we need to get back to as our role as fidu fiduciary to be asking questions about how money is allocated, reallocated, uh, and eventually spent along the way. So uh, I will be supporting this. I think this is a good step. I don't think it infringes on um, anyone's right. And I think uh, there's many protections in there, city solicitor, HR, um, uh, executive session, all of those things uh, that would at least uh, warrant a conversation. Thank you. Councilor, um, Councilor Cameron. Um, so I think I said either this, this, this year or last year that um, you know, we're, we're the city council, we're not 11 mayors, we have a mayor. I'm very keen on uh, city council uh, drifting into lanes that are, that are more appropriately um, you know, held and, and uh, managed by the executive of our city. Um, and I think this, this clearly falls within notification and I think it, it's very important, um, you, know, you know, I do hear the alleged um, argument and you know, I would be curious to see if there are other uh, municipal ordinances in Massachusetts or KP Law's thoughts on this, but I think this, this is absolutely um, you know, within our purview in terms of funds, um, and the word funds is mentioned in here, uh, for us to be notified about what, what's going on. And again, the executive session uh, can protect, uh, you know, people's reputations and, um, you know, when, when things are a little bit murky, um, uh, to the Ward 1 counselor's point, um, I think it does make it clear to the um, finance director, the city auditor, you know, when, when uh, the council would be notified. And, you know, this stuff happens at the municipal level. It happens uh, in all sectors uh, of, of our economy. Um, I've, I've uh, seen it, uh, you know, and, and people are always surprised afterwards. Um, and so I think, you know, we should not adopt a, a head in the sand approach here. Um, you know, I, I can think of at least a few instances that it would have been good for us to have been formally notified. Um, and when I say us, I mean the city council. I don't necessarily mean this city council. Um, so I think it, um, you know, definitely uh, is something that falls within our lane. Again, we're not them becoming the HR department. We're not telling the mayor uh, what to do, although people will, will say that. I mean, this clearly, um, the administration decides on, on what, uh, what uh, happens here, but, um, but I think for us to at least be notified um, is, is proper. Thank you, Councilor Cameron. Councilor Lane. Just a uh, talking point from what we've heard in opposition to this. So what if we removed um, uh, either alleged or confirmed and just left it as fraud? So within 30 days of the discovery of credible evidence of fraud, misuse, misdirection, does that make it a little bit more clear to this body to accept? Just a question. Councilor. Yeah, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> I very much respect, you know, our, our responsibility as a fiduciary, and I do think um, from that perspective, this is, this is an important ordinance. Um, but to the counselor from Ward 6 suggestion, so where I, I struggle a little bit here, I, I would love it if the word alleged was not in there. I, I understand um, why, but to me, um, a confirmed fraud, misuse, misdirection, et cetera, would would feel absolute for this. Um, alleged, I, I just worry about the possibility of us falling into a category where someone is alleged of something and actually found to not be guilty of this. Um, and in particular, the very last sentence says, um, said letter may be submitted as executive session materials. I would feel much better if that said, um, said letter shall be sub submitted as executive session. So again, if we're, if we're working with both potential for just alleged as opposed to con Confirmed, um, and saying that it may be submitted. I would hope the administration would have the sensibility to put it into executive session, but I, I just, it, it gives me a little bit of pause because I, I just want to make sure that we're not falling into a world where someone's accused of something, it, it's coming out potentially not even in executive session and then found to not be guilty of this. So I, I would love a way for us to clean the language a bit that would create 
Okay, so Councillor Z, thank you, Councillor Preston. Councillor Z first, then Councillor Khan. So I, I'll just be happy to address um, both of those. Um, so this is where I tried to stay off of this rail. We're not a court. We are not a court. We don't find people guilty or not guilty. And in fact, in a lot of ways, the administration isn't a court either. They don't find people guilty. And so the reason I want it alleged in there is when you send something with credible evidence, and that is a standard, you know, there have to be standards. We, we can't say, okay, if you see this transaction as a credit or a debit, then therefore it, it counts. You do have to rely on the professional opinion. In this case, you're relying on the professional opinion of the city auditor. City auditor. And I'm gonna just give you an example. Last year, I think everybody is aware that a department had left under questionable circumstances. And it's not the one that we spent eight months talking about here. But there's very little official information about that. And I would like to know, and I feel that I am entitled to know as a city councilor, and that those I represent would be better served if I knew it more formally. So that is the point, is something, you know, if something's alleged and it's credible, and that's what the city auditor deems it to be, if he doesn't deem it to be credible, then so be it. So that, that's where, actually, I do think you're getting into a world where you shouldn't be. You need to let somebody decide if they think it's credible evidence, and that is the city auditor. And that's actually was part of the heart of the discussion about auditor versus city solicitor. And then the last one, as far as may versus shall, the reason I don't like the word shall is that executive session requires a vote of the city council. There are only so many reasons why you can go into executive session. You cannot guarantee that the circumstances of, a, of one report or another would dictate or deem that. So what happens if you have this ordinance and then five out of six councilors only want to go into executive session and you're unable to get the votes to effectuate it? So what do you do now? It doesn't eliminate the need for the council to know. And so that's why it's May. Um, I would anticipate, frankly, as a matter of practicality, that the council would almost always accept an executive session for that purpose, at least based on my years on the council. However, we don't get to write ordinances for this council or what even any of us has seen over the last few years. We have to write durable ordinances forever. So that would have to be a circumstantial thing based on the, the nature. So I'm not opposed to trying to work it, but I just wanted to explain why those two things are in there. Um, in my opinion, to go to confirmed you know, is a, is a much higher bar and may never be reached if some kind of other settlement is reached in the interim. And that doesn't serve the public benefit. We still have to know to be able to have an impact on the future. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Zaid. Councillor Kahn, then Councillor Vogel. Um, thank you, Council President. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, I, I think, for, first of all, I, I just want to clarify by me not liking this, I'm not defending fraud. I, I don't condone any action like that. So I, I think I, it's important for me to, to emphasize that because that might be perceived, uh, which I wouldn't think so. But the reason I'm not in favor of this is I very much feel like if you look at our code of ordinances, and again, I was not at the meeting, but before that, I did look at some other ordinances. There may be this in some other municipality. I don't know for sure. But all I'm saying is, there's a lot of things in here that are talking about embezzlement, loss, misappropriation, which, you know, what does that mean? There's a lot of things like the person that we wrote this for is for the city auditor. So the auditor needs to confirm or look at these different lists of things. Misdirection is one of them. I mean, uh, all I ask is looking at section 2.176 that is in our code of ordinances right before which is called responsibility to mayor and council. This is under the responsibility of the city auditor. Section 2-176 is titled responsibility to mayor and the council reporting irregularities and monthly and annual statements and contents thereof. So we have something reporting irregularities. We're not calling it embezzlement. We're not calling it misappropriation, misdirection, loss. We're just irregularities. You know, there's a way to express it without kind of already saying what it might be. And I guess that's what my problem is. Like embezzlement, if you do a search of the word embezzlement in our code of ordinances, we really, we don't have it. It's a very strange, to me, codification for our municipal law. And that's why it's sitting uncomfortably with me because I feel like there's another paragraph before, like I said, from 1971, that maybe we edit this to, to kind of address how people are feeling. This is reactive. I think I've, I've heard that. This is a reactive, section 2-177 is reactive, and I get it, 
but I'm saying let's work with what we have and let's think of the appropriate language for it. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Mr. Cohn. Councilor Vogel. Yeah, thank you, Council President. Boy, it sure is enjoyable following uh, the Councilor at large because um, those are exactly my words. Um, I am concerned about the, the, the description further by the sponsor, though, who, who in, his, in, in the description, it felt like even more of a slippery slope that we're heading down because it's, it, it's maybe and then it, 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 it's alleged and um, it, those words just make it a very slippery slope for me as to where we're going with it or where the, the um, auditor may be going with it. I also, again, I wonder what we're going to do with that information and just because, so, so we know. Okay, so, so let's get to the point where something is alleged and then we know about it. How are we going to report that to our constituents who Odds are probably are not going to ask, but may. Um, I understand fiduciary relationship. I do not um, um, support fraud or any type of misappropriations. But I just wonder what we would do with that information. What good does it do for us to know, in particular, if it's an HR problem? Because we can't discuss it, at least not with our constituents. So what are we going to do with it? And back to the counselor at large point about how we, if this is already uh, directed, um, directs the, the um, finance director in the, in the paragraph before, the 176. Again, this is too much. It's, it feels been, been reactive and, and quite frankly, uh, vindictive. And, and that's very troublesome for me. So Councilor Wright hasn't spoken yet. So the language in, in, in the current section, 176, mentions irregularities. And I know in my short term on the council, there's been a number of irregularities. Have we been notified of any of them? So in the past, when I wasn't on the council, the language that's in the ordinance as it exists today does not provide the notice that the council deserves to have and that the taxpayers deserve to have. If there's something that is irregular or criminal or fraudulent, it's not enough to just sweep it under the rug and fire that person or change the process. This is we're doing the public's work. The public deserves to know. And the only way they're gonna know is if the city council knows. So I'll, I'm fully in support of this, the way that it's drafted. I'll support any, um, any amendments that get suggested, but uh, I'm gonna vote in, in favor of this. Um, many of you know my backgrounds in, in, in banking, and um, the CEO of the bank reports to the board of directors. Do you think that he is not going to tell the board if there's alleged misconduct in his bank? Councillor Z, Cou Councillor Z, then Councillor McCauley. Well, I, I'd just like to take, um, I'm, I'm happy and I, I do have a co-sponsor, but um, if, if it helps, um, we can remove the words. So within 30 days, credible evidence of, and then strike either alleged or confirmed, and just leave it at credible evidence. And I think that's friendly from both of us, so we don't need to vote on that. And, um, but I, I can't bend on the may versus shall, just because I think it's, it's infrastructurally deficient. You just don't know if an exec session will happen. So I'm, I may offer that as an olive leaf. I, I get the sense that at least a majority uh, feel that there's some merit to this, and, uh, and that's my offer, and, and uh, hope, hope it will go. Thank you. Okay. I'll yield on that. Councilor McCauley. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I'd like to um, kind of address the question that was asked. Um, what would we do um, if we knew uh, this was going on. First of all, I, I think we should know. I think it, it I've said that before. <coughs> I, I think that the important part of that is uh, items D and E, the actions taken to remedy the actions and the actions taken to inhibit those actions. We know people sometimes make mistakes, understand. But that's still, in a black and white world, is an irregularity, is a problem is something that should be called out and notified and, and remedied along the way. Um, it could be worse than that. It could be a third strike or a fourth strike or something like that that we haven't in the past heard about. 
Again, it, it, this is a binary type of discussion, yes or no. Yes, is there irregularity? Yes, there is. Does it fall into these categories? Yes, it does. Uh, again, we're taking the person out of this. There's an HR consequence that happens here. As is mentioned, we are not, um, we're not a court. We don't bring uh, criminal charges, but we should be alerted to some of these things that are going on. And really, the, as I said, when we know about it, the question we're all going to ask most likely is, uh, what do we do to stop it or change it? And what are the actions uh, taken to double down and prevent that from happening again? I think that's a good checks and balance for what we can do um, in our role. Thank you. So would you like to read in what your amendment, your friendly amendment was? It's the striking of the following words, um, alleged or confirmed. Uh, pardon me, either alleged or confirmed. So those four words are stricken, and the rest of the sentence connects and makes sense. Okay. So we're going to vote on the friendly amendment. So just want to leave it as is. You don't need to. Right? Okay. Yeah, as amended now. Yeah. All right. As it reads, not that first sentence, first line reads, within 30 days of the discovery of credible evidence of fraud, comma, misuse, et cetera. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Just Do you need a second on that? It's friendly. It's friendly. Yeah. Okay. So. Just a quick. Yep. <laughs> Part of our job is we have a fiduciary responsibility to the people in every board. I just want to remind everybody at that table right now, this fits in fiduciary responsibility. So with that, I'll let it go. Okay. Can we move the question? Yes. Is there a second on moving? Second. Then we have to vote on that. That's that we need to vote on. On the motion, move the question, if I may. Yes. Roll call. Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Lane? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? No. <coughs> Councilor Wallace? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Zeed? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Donahue? Yes. Councilor Sham? Yes. So the question goes right to a vote, I believe, President. Vote yes. on the amendment. Mm -mm. The, the amendment was friendly. The amendment has been accepted, so the amendment is there. So it would just be voting on ordinance. Everyone agree? Correct. On the motion to approve ordinance 132. Shall I? Yes. As amended. As, Thank as you. amended. <laughs> as friendly amended. Councilor Khan? No. Councilor Lane? Yes. Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? No. Councilor Wallace? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Cam Councilor Donahue? Sorry, yes. Councilor Zeed? Oh, sorry. <coughs> yes. <laughs> Councilor Cameron, you voted yes. yes. Councilor Donahue? <coughs> no. Councilor Sheehan? Yes. Motion passes. All right, thank you. That's it for um, business coming out tonight. Uh, just a couple of quick updates. Um, we will have our standing meeting on Thursday, uh, 6 o'clock. We'll be here. Um, we will take up Ordinance 129. Um, so I decided to pull it out tonight. I got some late comments from the administration and also some questions. Um, we had met on it a few times in committee, twice at least, going back to December, but want to make sure we have enough opportunity and not to, to try and do it on the floor. So that'll be coming up on Thursday. It, it was and is referred committee of the whole. So all are welcome if you wish to. Um, second thing is CPC has come in. You probably noted that. We referred that committee of the whole as well. Um, I do hope to, I will be docketing it for Thursday, but I don't know yet exactly which projects. I'm going to send out invitations and we'll see who, who is available. I've, I'm also going to ask um, the finance director and planning office to just give us some updates on where we are with past, past projects because we had some big bonds last year that are still, things are still in play and also from previous years that can be projects that have rolled over. So we'll hope to get a little bit of an overview to start, and then we'll go through each project. We did decide this year to keep them again in all in one order um, because they weren't as big as last year rather than spread, splitting them up. So we'll go through them and, and hopefully bring all of them out together if, if, it, if time allows. Last thing is um, you did hear from the mayor on the budget, but budget and CIP are coming, so expect within the no next one to two packets I will provide a schedule for the year. Uh, for all of the hearings and um, welcome any input as with last year. It's our first year doing budget and CIP together, as you know, so my goal, at least on paper right now, is to docket each department for a longer period of time. 
because we have to do both. So that may vary by department because some have more CIP and some have less. But um, you know, we were typically shoot for 20 to 30 minutes. We might try and shoot for more like 40, 45 minutes. So we might have a few more meetings, but hopefully on balance less than we would have had with budget plus CIP. So bear with me. We'll do the best that we can. And Thursday will be hybrid uh, for anybody who's watching who wants to attend. And public comment will be available hybrid too, if Got you it. wish. So that's it for budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zaid. Community services. Uh, motion to approve appointment 386. Second. Uh, this, is a um, this is a motion to um, uh, appoint Anita Greenwood to the Parks Commission. Um, uh, uh, Anita had joined us. Um, she let us know that she's been here four years. She walks the parks almost every day. Um, she does see that the parks need some care and is very motivated to be involved with it. She loves the outdoors, <coughs> wants to contribute. She has a feeling of environmental inclusion and would like to bring that forward to the Parks Commission. Um, she does have a background of being a pickleball sponsor and wanted to make known that um, she would be fair-minded and uh, in terms of use for all folks within the parks itself, we had recommended her approval three to zero. Further discussion? Roll call. Roll call on appointment 386, Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor Lane? Yes. Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. Councilor Wallace? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Zeed? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Donahue? Yes. And Councilor Shan? Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve order 431. Second. This is the parks bench policy. Uh, this is uh, um, order, this was, uh, uh, this has evolved from the par previous Parks Conservancy. They have 173 benches today. They've, um, uh, some of them are pre uh, this year. Uh, most of them are. They will be grandfathered into 2028. Uh, they want to have a 10 year period and then they'll expire. They want to set some standards for plaques and memorials. They've given a couple of options within that. Um, we talked about renovation versus maintenance uh, beyond uh, the 10 year option of these things. Uh, sometimes um, they, they need to be rebuilt and that, um, that is really the case in many of these ones going forward. The parks director, uh, parks manager will be looking to see about contacting some of these people who have you know parks from 20 years, uh, benches from 20 years or so, uh, uh, to see how they'd like these things handled. Um, we're in that transition period along the way. But the new policy has an application, it's pretty straightforward. Everything goes to the Parks Commission uh, for uh, review and approval uh, along the way. Uh, we had recommended um, approval of this three to zero. Thank you, Councilor McCauley. Further discussion or comments? Councilor Zaid. Yeah, I, I want to just say um, I, I support this and I think anything that, that adds clarity to this is helpful. I also think maybe this will be instructive as we talk more about the central waterfront and maybe some lessons learned from here. I know Mike Hennessy was a big big part of this draft and has to deal with it. My only suggestion uh, would be in, in time, I really do think this should, this should be codified as ordinance. Um, especially since there's a fee in here um, that's stated. There's a $5,000 figure and there's a $50 figure, I believe, uh, if, unless I missed any other ones. So I think, I don't think it's a hold up, but I think in time it would make sense to fold into our growing parks ordinance. And it will just then become, for all the reasons, you know, we've talked about with ordinance versus orders, it, it becomes easier to follow and see when it's been amended and it's a little bit easier. But um, a tr great effort and um, thanks to Mike Hennessy, the Parks Commission as well. And, and the sponsors. Thank you. Further comments? Council Wallace. Yes, thank you, President. Um, I, I do want to commend uh, the Parks Manager for putting this together. I'm a big fan of policies and procedures, and this is one that really needed to be done. The only thing that I, I'm still not quite comfortable with is that we're putting a 10-year limit on the benches. That just I mean, maybe maybe that ha happens elsewhere, but it just seemed a little strange to me because you know, what if what if you do buy one for your father and you come back in 20 years and, and it's not there? But um, I'm not going to make a motion. Or, but you know, I'd be curious what other members think about it. Um, I know that like sometimes for a cemetery, this, this is different, but you can pay like even a, a bigger amount to have a done in perpetuity. So um, that could be another option for somebody who doesn't want to have to come back. So thank you. 
Councilman yeah, Colley. Uh, thank you, Council President. I, I just want to address that. We did talk to the Parks Manager and uh, the Head of the Parks Commission who was there as well. Um, you know, they're, uh, uh, they're in a bit of a quandary. They, they ran out of benches and they ran out of places to put them <coughs> and all of that, and yet they still have financial needs going forward. This is a fundraiser. This isn't a memorial park um, going forward. And so um, they've tried to, they're, they've committed to be sensitive to this transition period. Um, again, they're spending effort and, to, and resources to reach out to some of these folks um, and, you know, through social media, phone calls, et cetera, along the way. I can't say that all of the older uh, records are intact, but, you, you know, the, we have avenues in the library, et cetera, to pursue some of these things. Uh, and they all had spoken about trying to, you know, reach out to these people and be sensitive to it. There are some people they know that they're not going to. There are alternatives they're kicking around, maybe, uh, you know, having a, a memorial uh, web site or plaque or something like that to commemorate all those ones that are moved off in a certain period. But again, um, to, to the question about order versus ordinance, they're learning and they want to um, take some steps, put a policy in place, learn what's good, learn what's bad, get some review from us and be able to then codify it into an ordinance going forward. Thank you. Councilor Z. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I, I had and, and in some ways have the same heartburn, but I think the, the challenge for me is there's a difference between a bench you had anyways and that the city, say, needed a bench in a certain position and then offered a, a plaque on it mm -hmm. versus literally installing a bench, a new bench at somebody's re request. And that's where you get into the real challenge is that when you proliferate so many benches by request, you're now carrying tons of benches and then when they all turn over and there has to be money in, in place to, to support them. and how much can you collect? And, I mean, this is, the, this is the budding part of the conversation with the central waterfront is, okay, it's great, we, we have it, it's something we want to have, and then in 10 years we didn't really want to have it or we don't have a need for it any longer, but we feel an obligation to carry it. So I do think the best thing to do would be to be very transparent up front about what you're buying and what you're not and how long one would expect it to last. Um, I do think that um, one thing they'll, they'll probably learn over time is just offering a renewal to the person before they maybe make it available in inventory. I didn't see a lot about that, but they could always approach that person or that estate or that whomever and say, hey, your time's up. If you'd like to go for another 10 years, we'd appreciate your, your donation, so to say, or your, your not donation, it's not the right word, your, um, your payment towards that. And then if they say no, then you can return it to the pool for somebody else maybe to pick. So that's my challenge. And I can just tell you, like it, it says in here, they can't take new benches at certain parks because they already have so many. So we're beyond where we just need places for people to sit in some cases. And we're just putting benches in to honor people, which is not a bad thing, but it's a lot of benches, so. Great. <laughs> Councilor Lane. Yeah, I, I just want to echo. I think that the 10 year thing is kind of wonky. It's a memorialization that's only 10 years, so you're only going to be remembered for 10 years, and once that, you can pay to do it again. I'd like to see, and just that, you know, for whoever is listening out there, um, if we had bricks as well down by the waterfront, that if there is a 10-year lapse, it's not that people just spend their money and after 10 years it's gone away if they don't choose to or don't have the money to remember them, but just having like bricks down by you know, the waterfront would be great, I feel. I mean, I know in Fenway, I've see, I, I know people that are on bricks, and it's a great way to go and memorialize them and just, you know, think of them. So whoever's listening, just something to think about. If that's, a, if that's an option, maybe, we, you know, after the 10 years, they get a brick. So just Thank a suggestion. Councilor Cameron? I'm just going to make a procedural comment. Um, in line with my earlier uh, discussion of uh, sort of uh, 11 mayors and, and, and people's <laughs> lanes, um, to me, this was derived from the parks manager approved by the parks commission. Certainly should be vetted um, by the appropriate committee and voted on by the council. But I think all the details are best left to them other, 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 unless we want to become sort of a, a de facto, you know, parks commission overseer. Um, so I appreciate all the work and, and I, I, I know there's a level of detail that um, we sometimes want. I think here we can just kind of go with what they're recommending. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Cameron. Councilor Khan. Yeah. Thank you, Council President. I just had a quick question. Um, I, I will be supporting this. I think this is great to have the policy. Um, tracking, is this part of like, um, in terms of tracking the applications and keeping the timeline on the 10 year, is this gonna be part of the DPS's already kind of tracking tool or is there some tracking tool that was talked about for this? 
Councillor Bacali. Uh, yes, uh, they will be tracking this as part of their donation, um, which is required by law. You would send them a notification that uh, they've received $3,000, $5,000 for your bench, X amount for your bench, X amount for your donation, and they would need to track that uh, for their time frame, and they would do it. Um, it's only 173. I think they're going to track them by Excel spreadsheet. Okay, thank you. Further questions? All right. All those in favor? <laughs> it is an order, correct? Yep. It is. Yep. All those in favor of approving Order 431, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, motion to approve, thank you, Council President. Motion to approve Ordinance uh, 145. This is an amendment uh, on uh, Chapter 11.5 for Rural Parks and Playgrounds. Second. Um, this is a cleanup. This is uh, uh, part of a cleanup from the uh, Parks Reorganization Plan. Um, and while they were there, the Parks Commission thought they would add a couple of more um, edits to it, uh, slight um, things like uh, uh, instead of tennis courts, just courts now, um, trying to be a little bit more generic, no inflatable equipment, ground stakes, those types of things that they always wanted to add but didn't want to bother. Um, yes, we've gone from uh, Parks uh, Director, Parks Commission, to Parks Manager. Uh, we've gotten rid of... Um, um, uh, the parks director uh, as need be um, and um, their delegation authority uh, is uh, they'll set rules for that to be able to delegate that and they'll set um, policy and procedures of parks preservation going forward that will be a, a parks commission uh, type of uh, regulation that they'll uh, keep updated going forward so they won't have to keep updating these types of documents and uh, other than that uh, again we voted three to zero to approve it Discussion. All right. Ordinance. Roll call. Roll call on approving Ordinance 145. Councilor Khan. Yes. Councilor Lane. Yes. Councilor McCauley. Yes. Councilor Preston. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Wallace. Yes. Councilor Wright. Yes. Councilor Zeed. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Dunnew. Yes. Councilor Shan. Yes. Thank you. First reading. Uh, motion to approve Ordinance 147, amended Muni Fee Parks and Rec. Second. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, as you see, it's an eye chart in your uh, packet. Um, quite frankly, the uh, Parks Commission uh, just kind of simplified the things that they were going through. There's no real wholesale changes here. Uh, there were minor things, um, uh, adding uh, columns G and H. Uh, they're labeled down at the bottom. Um, and uh, as you can see, as you look down each one of these columns, um, all, the num all the numbers are, for the most part, uh, homogenized going forward. Uh, we approved the three to zero. Discussion. Thank you, Council McCauley. All right, roll call. Motion approving first reading ordinance 147. Councilor Khan. Yes. Councilor Lane. Yes. Council McCauley. Yes. Councilor Preston. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Wallace. Yes. Councilor Wright. Yes. Councilor Z. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor Dunnew. Yes. Councilor Shan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion to uh, receive and file communication 471. Second. This is a resident letter uh, on the pickleball at Atkinson. It was uh, uh, submitted by uh, Phil Cooty and a number of people uh, had signed his petition. Um, he had presented um, and reviewed his letter with us. Uh, we had quite a bit of public comment along the way. Um, you know, he is concerned with the safety overuse and narrowing of the field during times. We did have uh, the pickleball folks uh, represented, as you heard tonight, at public comment. Um, after uh, some lengthy discussion, really, I think um, the spirit of compromise took over and everyone figured out that there is a way that everyone can kind of work around uh, the situation. We're leaving it with the Parks Commission because, as we said, um, programming belongs with the Parks Commission uh, going forward and they need to step up on that. Some concerns, uh, you know, that we noted you know, when we talk about organized play, we talk about fees and structures and those types of things versus pickup. Uh, again, Parks Commission was very well aware of that. Um, and so uh, I think overall we had a lengthy discussion about it, a lot of public comment, but overall um, it was, it was uh, well worth the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Discussion. All right. All those in favor of receiving and filing communication 471, say aye. 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 
And uh, Council President, one last thing. We had uh, Ted Beretti, uh, Chair of the uh, Parks Commission, in attendance. Uh, he gave us uh, uh, an overview of some of the things that were priorities for them in, in, in um, the Parks Commission. First of all was making um, the reorganization plan work. Um, they agreed that they needed some time to work through, especially with, um, at that point, not knowing uh, a new DPS director coming on, and they want to make, make sure that they can build a working relationship with the new DPS director, the parks manager, and themselves, as well as um, um, factoring in the Port Park Alliance along the way. So uh, they've asked, you, you know, they've stated that's a priority for them to get in that working relationship uh, kind of um, behind them. Um, the things that they had talked about in terms of uh, things uh, that are priorities for them, they wanted to talk about safety and beautification of the parks overall. They wanted to talk about improvements. There are a number of improvements that you'll see in the CPC coming forward that they'd like to talk about. Those items that they wanted to specifically talk about was uh, the Bartlett Mall, Lower Atkinson. Uh, they talked about the fully accessible uh, playground coming in. They thought that was a, a big deal in terms of being able to bring people into the parks again. Again, a programming uh, type of issue that goes on. Um, you know, they, they're always looking for funding streams uh, in order to fund some of the things that they want to have there. Um, uh, new on their list this year is Woodman Park, uh, and they're trying to explore an off-road uh, biking, uh, pump bike uh, type of scenario somewhere in the city along the way. Again, you'll see some of these things in CPC. But um, uh, one of the things that we, um, we all, we did agree on uh, collectively, which was just a little outside of uh, Parks Commission, was that we really needed to finish the safety zone down at the Pioneer Field. We, uh, we voted, uh, the previous council voted to establish a safety zone. We voted to expand the safety zone, um, but we haven't finished it. We need, the, we de we need um, markings, we need lights, we need those types of things. And uh, Ted had mentioned that it is a priority uh, to create a safe environment down there uh, at, at the Pioneer Field in Lower Atkinson. Um, thank you. All right. Order for one, order for one more. The NCOD bylaws. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> just didn't, sorry, uh, my mistake. Um, uh, uh, motion to approve Order 422, the new report commission on disability bylaws. Second. Second. Uh, first of all, I, I apologize. It was in my notes and my handwriting was terrible, so I apologize for that. Um, the commission did a fabulous job in writing um, bylaws along the way. Uh, they had some um, uh, uh, commenting and editing uh, by um, the at-large counselor on the committee. Uh, who had some experience with this. They took some of the um, recommendations and they held firm on some of the other ones in terms of committee members and time meeting and all of those types of things. Uh, we think that this is a good first step for all um, uh, groups that um, don't have bylaws that should probably use these as a framework to be able to uh, go forward and create framework on these. But particular to the uh, Commission on D Disabilities, I think uh, they did a, 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 an excellent job. Um, um, it's, um, they had reviewed it, they had an advisory committee, um, and uh, it went through council, and we approved the three to zero for approval. Thank you, Councilor McCauley. Councilor Zaid. Can I just ask a question first? So the, um, the Strikes and all that, are yeah. those accepted or are those not, or not sure? Yeah, yeah so, um, so uh, um, we had some problems sending it into and having it come out in committee. So pretty much the strikes, yes, where you see notes, for the most part they were accepted. The strikes were accepted in terms of uh, um, advisory type of scenario. They did not accept the strikes for or recommendations for number of members, number of times met, things like that. But uh, it was clearly evident that what the committee wanted them to do was to acknowledge that um, they, they, don't, they don't get to tell people what to do, but they're more advisory as to these are our needs, these are the things we suggest uh, to different city departments, et cetera, along the way. And I, I think in a nutshell that sums it up, but please feel free, I don't want to speak for you. Yeah, no, so the, uh, I don't know what happened to the strike throughs in the end. Um, they, they were there, somehow it just didn't come through. But um, ultimately what you see here 
is what they have accepted of. So some of the comments you'll see, because uh, I don't know why the strike throughs didn't happen, but the comments do still sit there. Um, some of the comments they did not accept, and you know, I, I, I tried to advise them. I, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's their bylaws. They have to live by it, and I'm fine with them not accepting some of my advice. Um, but the, the version that you see here with the comments is the amended version. So that would, in other words, it, it incorporates what they are accepting of my advice as well as maintain some of the things that they chose not to take on board. Does that make sense? Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> it's just hard to read. Yeah, okay, I know. So. I, I just, sorry, this morning I asked for it to be updated. Or yeah. Yesterday, I guess, but it, it didn't make it. Well, my, my two main things are, um, and maybe in concert with advice you did give them, was um, I, I do think 13 is a lot for a commission. It's funny, we're in the process of shrinking our planning board, but I, I do take exception with up to. Um, I don't think you can have a commission with up to a certain number of members. It has to be a defined number of people. Mm -hmm. And then because below they had something about quorum and they said, okay, you know, four people, but if you have 13, it doesn't make, it, it doesn't, these, all, it all has to start with here's the number of people on the board and then a quorum can come from that and, and so forth. So that's number one. And then uh, number two is, um, in terms of membership, um, I, I'm not sure if two and three, are, especially number two, really kind of supplants the charter. I mean, appointments of mayor, mayoral power, you know, by charter. So putting in additional things to say, okay, you have to first come to two meetings, I don't, I don't think it really passes legal muster. I think, you know, the mayor may want to appoint somebody who's been to two meetings. They may want to appoint somebody that has been recommended by the board, but in the end, that power is really with them. So I, I might suggest something like, you know, it's, it's recommended that, that residents interested in serving, sir, you know, visit two meetings or participate in subcommittee work. Um, and then finally, uh, I know uh, one of the at-large counselors probably knows this better than me, but the term, um, is that really something best set by, by this uh, type of thing, or is that something better set? I mean, you know, some commissions have draw their, their terms from, say, state statute or something like that, but <coughs> it does mean that in a bylaw we would say, okay, it's three years. What's, you know, in other places it's set by ordinance. So those are my two main things, assuming that, because I agree with all the strikeouts, I mean, I think, and then probably, and then some, but at least those are pretty, were pretty important to me as well. So good, good, thank you for putting that time in. Councilor Donahue. Thank you, President. I'm happy to clarify a couple of these items. Um, first off, the number of members is actually born from the MLG uh, regarding to commissions on disabilities. Originally, the state mandate was for it to have seven to nine members. That actually changed a few years ago in MGL. They are now allowed up to 13 members. That is what it says in the state mandate, so that's why they chose that language. Um, the reason that the state came out with that new mandate, because with most boards and commissions, um, it's hard to fill. But with the Disability Commission, notwithstanding any more or less difficult to getting volunteers, the sheer number of different disabilities to be represented on the commission is what drove that number up to 13 because they want an even keel of all the different disabilities represented. So that's really where that number comes from. It comes from um, just that there's that many different disabilities to be represented and um, it is a sta the state mandate recommendation. And secondly, in far, um, as far as um, the other strikes also state mandated language that they boilerplate used. Um, as far as the uh, number of meetings, they have never had any issue with getting folks to come to the meetings, um, shy of maybe having one vacation month a year. And um, while I appreciate the advice from the at-large counselor with experience on another commission, um, with all due respect, the Disability Commission does kind of stand slightly on its own from the rest of the city commissions and boards because it is a state-driven mandate commission um, with much of its, much of its um, direction is, is driven by a state mandate. And I do know that the work on these bylaws outside of the boilerplate language was essentially collected by meetings um, 
with other municipal commissions on disabilities and what they have in place in the municipalities for bylaws. So um, they really weren't looking to reinvent the wheel or change anything so drastically from what we might normally see at our other boards and commissions, but this is a very specific board um, that deals with people, deals with disabilities, deals with a very largely underserved demographic um, in, in, in the Commonwealth um, and certainly in the city. So that being said, that is um, the best I can give for an explanation on behalf of the author and the Disability Commission. Hopefully it gains unanimous support because um, it's really within their purview and, and uh, the state mandates. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Donahue. Councilor McCauley. Yeah, if it, uh, if it would, uh, uh, thank you, uh, by the way, for that update, uh, Councilor. Uh, the, if, if it would help um, in Article 3, Membership Item 2, which it says resident, just insert prior to that, it is recommended, and therefore we're not uh, producing a statutory requirement on the mayor, and if, and if that went through, um, I, I need to propose that as amendment because we're not the sponsors. Second. And on which piece? I'm sorry. 3-2, Article 3. So it's, it's where it reads, um, our Article 3 membership, it currently reads residents interested in serving shall first attend two meetings. Um, I think the council is suggesting that it says it's recommended. Yes. That. I'll take that as a friendly amendment, but I will just say that it is the boilerplate from the MOD, that piece. Sure. Though it doesn't drive with our, what we have in place here. So I'll, I'll take that friendly amendment. Okay. So um, uh, I'm sort of reversing my prior opinion. Maybe we should vote on the um, amendment even though it's friendly because we've got a motion to approve from someone who's not the sponsor and counselor. It gets confusing. Okay. Yes. Let's so, so say it again. What is the amendment? The, the amendment, I believe, is to insert before the word residence on Article 3 membership, uh, paragraph 2, it is recommended. And then the word shall gets dropped. It is recommended residents interested in serving. Oh, shall first. Are we striking shall also? I don't know. No, I don't think we so. Were, no. We were not. I think we need Re recommended that they shall. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. We recommend. Okay. Does everyone understand what the amendment is that we're voting on? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Can I? Sorry. Just uh, to, to satisfy the Ward 1 counselors, um, would you also look for a amendment to get rid of the words up to 13 members? Yes, I was um, would I'm happy to do them members? separately, though, if this one oh, was okay. okay. I was just trying to. Yeah, let's do it okay, separately. Okay. So the motion on the floor is to, uh, I'll motion to amend first and second and to add the word, it is recommended before the word residence. Correct. Yes. All right. All those in favor of the amended language say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank okay. you. Okay. Is there another amendment someone wants to offer up? Sure. So amendment to strike the words uh, shall consist of just up to, and sorry, uh, Article 3, Paragraph 1, uh, strike the words up to. Second. Councilor Zaid. Yeah, and just speaking on the amendment, I mean, to me, it, it's functionally similar in the sense that there can be vacancies, but it, then the board is defined as 13 people, and then we probably can talk about some of the other ones a little bit easier. Um, but um, to the Ward 2 Council's point, if, if, if the goal was to allow for uh, en enough people to represent all the potential disabilities, then those positions would still be available, <coughs> and if they can't be filled, they can, but they exist. Um, and then I think secondary debate will just be what's really a quorum at that point, but, but I, I agree with this amendment narrowly to strike the words up to. I think it's better governance to be clear. Discussion. Councilor Donahue. Um, thank you. I do appreciate um, the looking to come to compromise, but I just still feel strongly that that piece is boilerplate from the MOD, and that is the recommendation to have that language up to, so I, I wouldn't support that amendment. But we can vote on it. Okay. <laughs> All right. All those in favor of the amendment proposed by Councillor Preston say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Roll call. Roll call on the amendment striking the words up to. Councillor Khan? No. Councillor Lane? No. Councillor McCauley? No. 
Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? No. Council Wallace? No. Council Wright? Yes. Council Zeed? Yes. Council Cameron? No. Council Donahue? No. Council Shan? Yes. Motion fails. Okay. All right. Motion to approve. That leaves the motion to approve on the floor. Second. Please. All right. All those in favor of approving as is, as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. One no. Uh, th uh, Council President, that's it. We have our next meeting on the 4th. Uh, thank, thank you, you Councilor. Um, general Government. So <coughs> we came out of our General Government Committee. We uh, did have a continue the discussion on the Brown School. I will note that Communication 467, which is the Municipal Buildings Report, we are going to discuss at our next meeting next Monday. Molly Edinburgh will be there for that. It's not Committee of the Whole, so if anybody has questions they want to answer or want to ask, please send them to me uh, before the meeting. Um, and then the other item that we kept in the committee was Ordinance 146 uh, at the request of Councilor McCauley. Uh, it was a discussion on whether we wanted to keep the, we wanted to have a discussion with the DPS director, whomever that was going to be, before we uh, proposed moving forward with this one. It was a determination of whether we wanted to have it in the the responsibility in community services or whether it should be in PWS since that's where parks would be. But that was going to be a conversation we we're going to have with DP, the DPS director. So we will uh, probably wait until we have the official DPS director and then we'll have that discussion probably at the last meeting in April. So with that being said, uh, that's it from general government. But we will meet next Monday at 5.30. Uh, license of permits, Councilor Vogel. Um, yes, motion to approve application 123. Second. Yes, Councilor Vogel. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the the um, committee met. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. The um, uh, applicant, uh, Randy Curry, uh, who has been doing this for uh, quite a number of years, I think it was 30, 30 some odd years, <laughs> Um, was a little bit surprised to be in chambers being questioned about his application, so that was a, a little bit of an eye opener. I guess perhaps over the years I hadn't uh, um, hadn't, hadn't remember him coming in either. Um, so uh, we approved this three to nothing. The questions we asked were: Are there any concerns um, with regard to any lawsuits against him or any major complaints? And he answered, "No. There's been no complaints um, over the years." Um, there was one little um, bit that, um, in terms of this bond, that automatically renews um, as terms of the timing. Um, so he, he confirmed that he would uh, um, bring in a copy of that renewed bond. So okay. we approved, as I say, three to nothing. Further questions? Discussion? All right. All those in favor of application 123 say aye. 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 Opposed? Somebody second that. So I guess it's appropriate to Somebody motion to approve that. application 125. Yes. Second. Yeah. I will be recusing myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> got it. You got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, this was, um, we probably discussed this for, what, three or four hours on end trying to get to the solution on this one. <laughs> to try to get an invitation. <laughs> um, yeah, we voted three to nothing to approve. <laughs> there. All right, the, the, any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? All right. Just one quick update. Sure. Um, we can let Mark oh. back in. We, we, did dis we did have a conversation okay. with... No, you're good. We're done. Come on in. Thank you. Um, just to kind of update you, we did have a conversation with... Um, the, the uh, uh, firehouse um, regarding the shanties, and there were a number of questions that, that were um, kind of left open and some um, information um, sought. So we're looking forward to talking with him again. Um, we left it in committee, and we will be discussing it further um, perhaps the next meeting. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Vogel. Councilor Cameron, Planning and Development. Uh, thankfully, nothing um, out tonight. Uh, we are going to have our next meeting um, scheduled for Thursday, April 6th, and the thought is to have a uh, discussion there of the zoning amendment regarding the ITIF and the parking and uh, retail sale of marijuana, if anyone's interested. And um, I do, I 
I, um, I should have checked the minutes before we approve them tonight. I thought the, uh, the communication on retail sale of marijuana, my notes said it was a committee of the whole also. Uh, maybe maybe I, I, should, it is. I should review the tape because I put that note in, but I think. It was meant to be. Okay, but it's. Uh, it's worth. Okay. All right, well, if it's uh, planning and development, it's planning and development. So but anyway, we'll be meeting that night on that. You're all welcome to come listen. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. Public Works and Safety, Councillor Wallace. Thank you, President Shand. All right, um, motion to receive and file appointment 382, Tom O'Brien as an alternate to the Water and Sewer Commission. Second. Second. So this is going to be replaced, or, or is being replaced by what came in um, in the packet to have to appoint Tom O'Brien as a full-time member of the Water and Sewer Commission, which will be coming into this committee. So um, no need for this particular appointment language at the moment. Thank you. All right. All those in favor of receiving and filing appointment 382, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, next up. <coughs> um, I'm gonna take it a little bit out of order here. All right. Motion to receive and file communication 466, Disability Commission Handicap Parking Violation Second. Data. Second. All right. So this was um, a really good, clear um, summary and fact sheet that was put together by the Disabilities Commission, um, kind of researching fees for handicapped parking, what the history has been, what the trends are, and then finally they come up with a recommendation. I can't do it justice myself. We had um, Councillor Donahue, or the Councillor from War Two, and Kristen Farrell um, joined in on our meetings to explain it, but I'll, I'll summarize it and then I can hand it over to them if they'd like. Um, so currently um, violation costs $100 for the first offense and then uh, $200 for the second offense, but that has historically been hard to track if it's a second offense or whatnot. Um, they have concerns that people are, are using these spots that should not be using these spots, We're using them illegally and um, they, they walk through the reasons why, but in the end they're recommending that we change the fee to $300, which is the maximum amount by state law allowed, $300, $300 for any, any violation. Um, hopefully to reduce the parking problems and then also to generate additional revenue. So um, I will defer to Councillor Donny, or Councillor from Ward 2 if she's interested in following up. Thank you, Down yes, here. absolutely. Um, thank you for that summary. I can certainly provide a little bit more background. Um, the, uh, the maximum recommended mandate from the state of 300 um, is basically the, the it's, it's the highest number that we could, you know, ever ask to put on a sign and deter people from pulling into those spots because it is the state mandate um, at the higher end. We currently have had the $100 fine in place with the $200 subsequent fine um, for the past several years, about six or seven years since it was adjusted, um, and there has not been any decrease. Um, the commission definitely feels that part of that is because it's unclear that a subsequent fine is a $200 fine. They, they have tracked the fines for the past five years, which was never done before, and there never were any subsequent fine amounts that were issued. Um, so it became sort of a, uh, a misguided premise to have the subsequent fine amount, and they just would prefer to be at the state highest um, recommendation, along with other communities such as Salem, um, uh, is $300, Marblehead is $300, um, North Andover is $300, there's another three, I just can't think of off the top of my head, that Gloucester I think is $300, there's a lot of comparables that have now moved to that $300 mark to be their acting deterrent from people pulling into those spaces for just five minutes. That is a premise. Um, we have tried very hard 
over the years on the commission and um, this past year, since I've not been a member, it is something that they have actively been tracking and trying to address. And um, this is essentially a continuation of work that started about seven years ago. And this is um, the culmination of them collecting data all that time. So the data supports the need. There is rampant abuse. And if we can pinch them in their pockets a lot harder than the $100, they are going to hopefully be much um, less inclined to do it again. As far as the money goes, um, it should be understood that all handicapped parking fines do 100% by MGL law go to the Disability Commission funding. That allows them to help pay for things in the city that are going to help people with disabilities. So this may very well fall in line with their efforts for a master plan to address all the lacking corners of curb cuts throughout the city and help with funding for things like that. So um, that's the premise, and it is worthy. Um, it does seem like a lot, but we're talking about disability parking. These spots are needed by the folks that are allowed to use them, and the folks that are not are just perpetually like, breaking the law, no matter how much enforcement is stepped up. They don't care. They'll pay the $100 for the 10 minutes to run into the store. Um, and that's been the pattern. So I kindly ask that you all support these efforts from the Disability Commission and um, just swallow that big number because really people that are getting it are doing something very, very wrong. Thank you, Councilor Donahue. Thank you. Councilor Wallace. Sure, thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up that um, in the next item that we're gonna be discussing and then voting on would be a better time to actually get into the, not that it, everything you said was, was spot on, but um, because in a, we will be debating the amount of money on the fees, but I would recommend this time to ask any questions of Council Donahue or the methodology or, or you know informational gathering, and then in the next one we'll get more into the debate of the of the cost and vote on that. Thank you. Any other questions specific to the communication, Council no, McCauley? I just had a comment um, that I made in the committee as well. Uh, I was a dissenting vote on this. Um, and um, it was really, when I looked at the data that was here, um, there's 86 violations only half of the year this year, um, and that's more than all of the other years. Um, it's the highest that it's been over the last number of years that they've been tracking, the six years they've been tracking this. Um, I had made a case that it was, we've, we've implemented some 15 minute spots, we've implemented uh, some 10 minute uh, parking spots, things like that, and we've increased, um, uh, um, y you know, um, uh, making sure that we, we follow up and we have our, um, our parking clerks out there uh, actually writing tickets as opposed to just moving along. And this is evidence that we are uh, making progress here, even though the numbers are, are rising, uh, they're rising in a good way in terms of um, trying to prevent people from doing that. Um, so I, I just felt this path that we had um, was okay, and like I said, I was just in the dissenting vote there. Thank you, Councilman McCauley. Further discussion on the communication? All right, so I believe the motion was to receive and file? Yes. It was. All right, all those in favor of receiving and filing communication 466, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, Councilor Wallace. All right, motion to approve ordinance 140, um, amending the municipal schedule for a parking fine. Second. All right, um, this is sponsored by the Councilor from Ward 5, and it is updating the various um, parking fines, and I apologize, the, there was um, a document that went to committee showing what the previous costs were, but I'll, I'll defer to Councilor McCauley in a minute. But the increases are, are um, fairly modest, and in some cases the previous ones stated ranges, and here it just, just has a number. Um, and another thing I apologize for is we did um, vote on an, an amendment for the handicapped parking zone. So um, based on the amendment, that would be uh, $300, or, oh, yeah, $300 okay. and that passed two to one in committee. Okay. So the overall um, 
ordinance passed 3-0, but I'll defer to the sponsor and counselor for further background. Council yeah, um, I believe everyone received from the clerk's office this uh, updated list uh, that was there. The ones that I'll point out are things, uh, um, there's no changes in the first two. Over uh, foot from the curb went from 10 to $20. Wrong position, 10 to 20. Driveway alley, 15 to 25. Uh, we're basically uh, matching what's going on surrounding our communities. Uh, the last one is bus stop, went from zero to 50. And as uh, uh, the committee chair had mentioned, um, uh, there was an amendment to move handicap to 300. Okay. Councilor Lane. <clears throat> um, I, I'm in full support of the maximum for the handicapped parking zone. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to the clerk. Is that chapter 90? No. No, handicap is not under chapter. Chapter 90 is in general rules and regs on um, moving violations. Moving violations, but I, I'm wondering if there's a way, so that correspondent said there was no way to track a second subsequent offense. Doesn't that get entered into the database depending on who writes it? So if May I? I mean, we have a fairly robust back end, and so if someone, the only way we've been able to track it, such that it is, is that if someone comes in and they appeal it, we go and we look to see if they had one previous. If they do, we would impose the 200 or 300, whatever it's going to go to. So if it's written by a... If someone is writing, they have a ticket writer out there. It does not pop up and say this is a second offense. Is there a capability to have the police come and write that ticket so it's tracked within... Their tracking would be the same as ours. It still goes against the license and registration. All right. My other question, if I could, um, I'd like to see add um, towed into that. I think that should be a towable offense. I think if you park in a handicapped spot, you should be towed, point blank. There's no excuse for that. It's probably one of the biggest disrespects that I've seen for somebody to park would be in a handicapped zone, and I would strongly urge us to go to the maximum and to add toad to that as well. Clark Jones? It's not my role to enter into the debate, but uh, the problem with towing is that, uh, as uh, the council from Ward 2 would know, 50% of the tickets written are people who are handicapped. They just forget to put it up. So. Got it. And it would be a that makes sense. Day to tow. Further discussion? Councilor Zaid. Just two things. I just want to confirm the over one foot or one inch from the curb. Because oh, it says well, one, one inch. So that's a scrivener's error, just yeah. to be corrected. That's an, that's an inch there, which I know was brought up when it, when it went to committee. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> um, I, mean, um, I, just, I just want to say that I frankly generally disfavor uh, increasing all of them. And I've been consistent on that over the years. And I, I do think, um, as, as sort of heinous an offense as it is, $300 is really punitive to somebody. And so there's been a lot of conversations of late about you know, aligning punishments with things. And you know, $300 for somebody could be um, a really challenging problem. Now, to be fair, they shouldn't have done the thing on the first place. But I will just say this is one of the reasons why I've opposed some of those. Sometimes it's handicap, and sometimes it's not spaces that we've done. Um, if you recall, there are a couple right here on Pleasant Street where they're only handicapped on Sundays. And it's very confusing, in my opinion, when people can't just rely on the sign from a distance while they're driving and say, yes, handicap or not. Um, and I think, you know, you, you just, it, it, it's, uh, it's even harder when you continuously elevate um, the, the fine. So I wouldn't oppose, I won't oppose $300, but I just want to say, to, you know, that I do think it's, that's, that's a pretty substantial number. And I do think that going forward, even though we've had those requests, I think we did that specifically for church services that we may just not be able to accommodate. It's parking is always about edge cases and trying to deal with like the odd case here or there, but those, those spaces in particular, um, I use them, but only sometimes, and I feel bad because I think everybody's looking at me when I park in them, but they're not handicapped spaces most of the time. But you have to really read the sign or know that okay. to know it, so. I yield, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Z. Further discussion? All right, it's an ordinance. Roll call. Motion to approve as amended, meaning uh, handicap parking is on 300. Uh, Councilor Khan? Yes. Councilor Lane? Yes. Councilor McCauley? No. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Vogel? Yes. 
Councilor Wallace? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Councilor Kazid? Yes. Councilor Cameron? Yes. Councilor Dunyu? Yes. Councilor Shan? Yes. Ordinance passes first reading. All right. And finally, motion to approve collectively order 432 and 433. Second. All right, so order 432 is a crosswalk at Federal and Water Street, and order 433 is just the general street layout of Federal and Water Street. Um, 432 is just because it, this is a standard procedure we do for crosswalks and different traffic measures um, as part of the requirement in the ordinances, or no, in the order. It, anyway. Um, what we have here is a grant that was provided by the Shared Streets Program. So Jordy Vining has been involved with this. Um, engineering, John Eric White and his team did the sketches that you see in your packet. And this is to help with some of the um, visibility issues and um, will provide some traffic calming. Um, and have safer crossings in this area because it's, it's pretty tight and, and hard to see in these areas. Um, this is sponsored by the Ward 2 Counselor and um, it was approved 3-0 and I could defer to her if she has any further comments. Thank you. All right, questions. Um, Councilor Monahue? Sure, thank you. Yes, Tom. Um, I did I know that this actual crossing is um, technically, I believe it's, it's in Ward 1, but I have received a lot of complaints over the year about folks trying to cross at the bottom of Federal from the Tannery. So um, when I saw this opportunity, it, it, it just rang a million bells of the right thing to do. And um, it's going to you know, provide access where previously there, there was not any ADA compliant or safe access across that. Both, both, you know, the end of federal and then crossing water. Um, so this is going to be a, a vastly needed improvement um, with, for the sight lines, for the, the cars coming, the cars turning, and folks just trying to get across from the tannery over to the other side of the tannery. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but it's uh, certainly a, a, a positive thing as far as I can tell. So thank you, Councilor Donahue. Councilor Zaid. I just had a couple of questions. One is um, uh, on the. Uh, Riverside, um, there's a box with hash marks like this, and then there's the crosswalk. Is that actually intended to be drawn on the ground? That you that did that question come up? Do you mean uh, along the curb line there? Correct. The the so you have the crosswalk, and then on both sides you have a box with hash marks. I believe so. I believe okay. so. Okay. My my first thought is um, that that's obviously not really customary. I mean, I don't know of any other ones where we really draw those, and um, I'm not sure why, I guess. Um, it just seems like a weird addition since it's not consistent. Um, the second question is, um, at the bottom of, we're at the corner of Federal and Water, it says sidewalk material TBD. Does anybody know what TBD has been, because they started on this a couple days ago, they had saw cut the streets and everything. Ah, we have somebody. So this was as TBD at the time because uh, customary, they're in the historic district, they needed to check with the property owner, but if they wanted to pay for an upgrade to brick, the answer was yes. Uh, on the um, left-hand side, at least, um, the, the property owner wanted it to be brick. Got it. Okay. And then uh, my last thing is just um, on the Water Street side again. Um, I do oppose having two signposts that close to each other. Um, with, there's a signpost with <coughs> parking, and then there's a signpost with a crosswalk. And just from my experience with the rail trail, uh, having come through, um, it doesn't help, and it really it it actually clutters everything up, and then none of the signs make any difference. So, uh, my suggestion would be. First of all, I, don't, I really don't think, knowing the area really well, that the no parking sign is needed. Nobody parks on that side. I've never seen a car in, in 10 years park on that side of the street. Um, my guess is it's already a no parking zone on what would probably be considered the northerly side of Water Street anyways. But at a minimum, I would put those two signs on one post. And I know it doesn't seem like a big deal, but my phone will ring if, if, if they don't go on one. So. I'm glad to hear about the material. I don't think the hash marks are needed. I don't. 
if we're going to start doing that regularly, that might be a different story, but it's, a, it's not normal. And in fact, when I've asked for that type of stuff, any sort of curb painting, I always get a no. So I'm just trying to, and then lastly, yeah, if, if those two signs could be either combined or, um, yeah, it combined is probably good because they usually, it's customary to have a, a crosswalk sign. Thank Council you. Council Wallace. Sure. I, I, I don't know the exact answer to the, the hash marks, but I assume that's just for no parking. And um, I actually have seen it elsewhere. Um, but I guess the bigger question is, is it something that's needed there? But I, I see the chief of staff had his hand. Please. Do they for no parking? Yeah, we, we, can, we can check. I, I don't think that would be needed. Uh, we'll check with the engineering department, but I, I don't think that would have to, have to be there. I'm, I thought it was just illustrative when I looked at it before, but if it's part of the plan, we'll, we'll check on that. Could I just ask one last question? Sure. Do you mind? Just, yeah. So I noticed also a number of tree pits, and I just was wondering, did, was there intention to put trees in them now, or that was like just for future, you know, future potential? Uh, yes, so they'll be selecting trees. Uh, with, they've been working with, um, at the moment, uh, Mike Hennessy for his thoughts on what trees would be a good fit for there. Okay. Um, so the only reason I ask is like, I, I, probably everybody on the council has turned this right turn at some point. I, I do it all the time, um, so it is definitely a welcome improvement. But I just would hate to see that um, that tree pit, particularly on the corner of Federal and Water, sort of on top of where the car is in the sat photo, that you would do all this work and then impede that sight line with a tree. You know, so I mean, maybe it's a selection of the right tree, or maybe it really shouldn't be a tree pit, because that cor that is the corner, that is the yeah. turn that is most challenging because people are, it, you can't see past, you have to creep out, especially if you're making a left or a right, but especially a left and then right, a lot of people just go now, just sort of slide through. So I'm just suggesting that that maybe shouldn't be a tree pit or if it is, it should, you know, we'll have to appeal to the brighter tree minds to tell us what would really look, work there and not detract from the whole point of it in the first yep. place. Noted. So Councillor Khan had her hand up and then come back to Councillor Wallace. People are talking about tree pits. I wasn't going to, so okay. come on yeah. Councillor yeah. Wallace. I was just wondering, that, you know, reviewing streets like this is, is a slightly newer thing. I'm wondering, um, you know, some of these changes I, I would be fine to me, but it sounds like there needs to be a little more discussion with the ward councillor. Um, so I would be happy to approve it with a condition that, you know, some of these, I, I don't know if there'd be any language that, no. No, just just to finish, I just wanted to bring these up, but I'll, I'll work with the chief of staff, sure. and you know, normally I, you know, as the DPS director gets settled, that that normally would be my path anyway. So I just wanted to note that these were my concerns, but overall, it is as the ward two council stated, a positive. Yeah, change. if you have any, um, if you want to put anything in writing and email it to us, whatever. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Wallace. Councilor Khan. Yeah, thank you, Council President. Um, yeah, this is a place I go all the time. So my one question, and, and I'm. I, I think it's fantastic to have these crosswalks, but um, the curb, the kind of curb cuts or the bump outs, um, I, I, I don't know what it is, but that street, Federal Street, has a lot of large delivery trucks, and there's a lot of actually parking that's, that they're just standing there uh, on the street at all times, you know, when they're doing deliveries at the tannery. I'm just wondering, and I'm just asking, and maybe the chair, they may have talked about this, but. I, it's not quite a traffic study, but I'm kind of curious about the feasibility of some of the trucks and their turning radius, and how do those bump outs work um, based on the size of these vehicles? So. Yeah, the, the city engineer slash interim DPS director did uh, address this about the, the, the turning radius. So this was designed, even these bump outs were designed with uh, a truck swinging uh, in mind. So, uh, you know, the city engineers does a pretty good job of these things, explained it pretty well uh, of, of uh, at least the keeping in mind that this was something that would need to be accommodated. So um, I think this was designed you know, with all those guidelines in mind. Thank you. Councillor White. Um, in my travels, I was up in Maine and they had a really nifty device for a blind corner. It's right across from the blind corner and it's an electronic device that tells you when cars are coming, and it flashes on and off um, to tell you that there's a car approaching from the left, car approaching from the right. I don't know if that's something we would want to look at. Councillor 
Can't. Go there because it's it's really taking your life in your in your hands every time you go left or right from there. Council so Preston. Yeah. So I also live just a few blocks from this and, and come through this intersection very very frequently and feel like I'm taking my life in my hands every single time. I am most often taking a left onto water off of Federal and that seems to be the worst to me. Um, so I. I I am no traffic study expert, but it, it, it just gives me pause. This actually seems more dangerous to me. The bump outs seem to help, but the crosswalks seem to even more dangerous to me. Um, most particularly the one coming across the end of Federal Street. They're right out there, basically right on Water Street at that point. Um, but so questions, um, one, would the existing crosswalk be removed if we were to put the new one in? That seems very confusing if we don't. Yes, so the existing crosswalk would be removed. So so the reason that the, the argument is this is much safer because it, first of all, moves it, it, while moving it closer, you could think, oh, they're closer to cars, they're much more visible. And so it's easier for folks to see uh, when they're driving, people who are, are walking there because <coughs> of, of the crosswalk being moved up. So that proximity to Water Street is actually a, a safety uh, concern. The other thing that's done is those bump outs there shorten the crosswalk considerably, which is extremely helpful. So you're, it's, a, it's a shorter distance for pedestrians to have to go. And then um, moving it up, um, it's, it's uh, much easier for <coughs> the folks who are turning right uh, off of Federal uh, to be able to see you know, what's, what's happening because they're much closer to Water Street. So um, definitely a design that is uh, using best practices in mind and, and something that uh, we think would, would be a lot safer. Councilor Preston. Was it taken into consideration? There are actually two existing crosswalks that are just out of field for this picture. So there's one that comes across from the tannery at, um, it goes directly into Fish. Um, so I don't know exactly where, what you would call that where you're coming out of the main part of the tannery and going across the street, but there's an existing crosswalk there that is, and the street is much more narrow at that point. To me, that seems so much safer to be going across a very narrow space. Um, maybe there's something we could do to, um, to make that more visible, that pedestrians might be in the crosswalk. Um, but that seems much safer that, to me than coming across this much broader intersection where cars are coming at you from two different angles at this particular place, whereas at Fish, it's, it's, you know, it's, there's one street you're crossing. And then, sorry, just let me finish, then I'll let you go. But, uh, and then the other crosswalk does come across Federal Street, again, just out of view here. Um, and again, it, it, so it, it gives you the ability to get from one side of Federal to the other without being in this particular intersection. And then, it, you know, you come down the sidewalk and then you have the ability to go from the, the tannery on one side of water to the tannery on the other side of the water and then nobody needs to be walking across this particular intersection. It, it just seems safer to me. But. No, I, I definitely understand that. I think we're dealing with uh, a system right now where the reality is folks are trying to cross around this area. There's desire lines that are set up and when connecting uh, from you know, the, the, the waterfront side to this area, you know, proximity to the tannery, these other streets. There are folks who are trying to cross around this area and, and uh, closer to, to here than the other crosswalk that you mentioned. So we're trying to honor that, those desire lines, uh, and, and we think that this is also going to be helpful just to have you know, more shared uses could slow down some of the traffic, um, which would be helpful for those turns that are happening there. So that, that's the overall conceit. Thank you, Director. I mean, Mr. Levine. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, motions to approve orders collectively. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, Councilor Wallace, anything else? No, nothing to report except we are meeting um, next week, April 4th, five o'clock, and we'll be discussing the road plan again. Thank you. Okay. All right, go to the order. <laughs> Councilor Preston. I would just like to note that it is our city clerk, Richard Jones's birthday oh tomorrow. My word. Happy, Happy tomorrow. birthday, Richard Jones. Looks <laughs> <laughs> like we just celebrated it in a past year. <laughs> Has it? <laughs> Put that in the minutes, please. Thank you very much. All right. Other fun items to bring up. 
Hearing none. Second. <laughs> all those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you all for being here in person tonight. <laughs> Mark, I didn't mean to ask. Who's getting married? My son. Oh. Yeah, my son and his fiance are getting married.